Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Uh, welcome to a long-awaited stream. It's time. Uh, today we're going to be uh, building a CRUD API with uh, the .NET Core, the dot, .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, <laughs> and C Sharp. Um, so it's going to be a fun time. Uh, now, in a past life, before my current JavaScript life, I actually did a whole lot of C Sharp uh, back before the .NET Core existed. Um, but yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun time. Yeah, and we're doing C Sharp instead of Node because I do Node all the time. Uh, and also, people people are interested in that kind of thing. Um, so we'll talk about it. What is the .NET framework? What's the .NET Core? How does it work, sort of? <laughs> and then we're going to use C Sharp to build the thing. Uh, I saw somebody ask, are we going to use Entity Framework? Uh, we are. That's the plan anyways. Uh, if you check out Working On, I have a, a rundown of all the things we're going to do. And um, I will say, this isn't necessarily a tutorial. <laughs> um, I am going to be building the thing, but I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I'll, I haven't done this. So I'm, I'm, I'm using C Sharp and .NET Core at work, and so I've worked with, I'm working with all of these things on a daily basis. But I haven't just like built a thing from scratch, and it's not going to be polished. But basically, you're going to see me build the thing. Uh, but if you check out working on this is what this is a rundown of what we're going to be doing, and basically we're going to be spending quite a bit of time uh, in the docs uh, because the docs are pretty good, and there's like actually quite a few tutorials just built into the docs here. Yeah, all the code will be on GitHub, all that good stuff, and um, if you do want to follow along, you technically could go here and use these links, um, but. I probably won't wait for you if you fall behind, but you can always watch the video later, all that good stuff. Um, build a front end with Blazor. Now that is something I have never worked with. I, I contemplate, so we are straight up, we're not gonna be doing ASP.NET uh, MVC, we're gonna be doing a web API. So this is very specifically uh, an API that receives JSON and sends JSON. Um, we're not doing any views or anything like that. Um, that's for a future stream. Maybe. <laughs> and welcome, everyone. Uh, we got quite a few supports. Uh, okay, not now. With that 13 month resub, who says, Hola, Senor CJ, otra vez de contiendo de calidad. Un saludo. Something about continuing. <laughs> but thank you, okay, not now. And thanks, uh, Pelfox, for that sub. Uh, Thijman with the 10 bits, Acid Spark with the 15 month resub. It's, it's their uh, quinceanera. Congratulations. And Chad with the 14 month resub. Gators, thank you for that sub. And Nori, thanks for that prime sub. Uh, we're going to be using Visual Studio Code. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's pretty cool, uh, I guess I'll, I'll show this when we're doing it, but what's pretty cool about um, all of the documentation here is um, you, in the docs, you can choose what editor you're using and it'll show you specific uh, instructions for that. So, like if you're using Visual Studio, that. But if you're using Visual Studio Code, it tells you what commands you need to run. So the, the docs are pretty pretty comprehensive. But yeah, we will be using Visual Studio Code. More supports. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, not now. Uh, contiendo equals content. Oh, okay. That makes. I mean, that makes sense. What did I say? Like continue. Um, another month of content. Cali, that is that calendar. I don't know. <laughs> And a sound of gaming with a five month resub who says, Happy five months. Glad I can finally continue my sub. Always look forward to these Fridays. As always, thank you for these streams and all the content. Oh, you're very welcome, Sound of Gaming. Thank you for being part of the community. Uh, and David, thanks for the 21 bits. I have 24, <laughs> 21 bits that I forgot about. Nice. And Data Fratata, um, thanks for that sub. Okay. Um, first of all, let's say hi to all the newbies because there's quite a few of you. Uh, all the first timers, welcome to the coding garden. You might have watched me before, but this is the first time you said something in the chat. So hello, what's up, Roddy Man and Cipher and Nori and Marco Dead? Wait, it's the first time you said hello and you gave support, right? That's a, wow, wow. Thank you. <laughs> what's up, Marco Dev? and M Slam and Hertesh and Jester? Yeah, we're gonna use Entity Framework. I'll talk about it. Uh, what's up, Base Nectar and Geraldine? Hello, and another random guy and Monkey, and five C eighty three seven B fifty four nine three one C A four four C zero seven. My green screen is blue. Do 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 do. Is this a? <laughs> is this just like a crypto address? <laughs> what's up, Alke? How's it going? Welcome, first timers. Hello, hello. Um. 
Yeah, I think I think we're, we're we'll we'll take like ten minutes just to say hi to everybody. Oh, it's just random hex bets, cool. Uh, uh, because I know people are interested in this, and so we'll let people trickle in, and then we'll get started on the actual content in about ten minutes. But for now, hello and thanks, Jim, for that uh, fourteen month resub. Wow! Wow! Okay. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good, Harry. I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest though; like, I haven't been sleeping very well. It's affecting my motivation. Um, I don't know. I think I need to go to the dentist. Long story short, I need to go to the dentist, and I haven't in a very long time. Uh, already, you can customize your um, your chat messages, so you can see that David uh, has customized their message to include the Python logo. Uh, and Drop Mania has the Huli logo and also the uh, Germany flag. You two can do the same. Yeah, I turned off all the sounds so it's uh, less interrupt. It, it interrupts me less. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, people, uh, just remind me uh, every ten minutes or so. I'm going to come back over here and um, review all of the events that have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg says they just went to the dentist after a long time. Yeah, I'm, the thing is, I've never been afraid of the dentist. I just don't want to go. I don't know. Maybe I am afraid. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, cool, 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 cool. Uh, oh, there's so many supports. Let's just talk about them because they're happening. Uh, Photon with that three-month prime resub. Thank you very much. Greg with the 15 months. It's also their quinceanera. And uh, Julian with the 13 months who says hello. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, I realize. So I'm, I'm missing a lot of the message messages, but one that came to mind, somebody was like, today I realized there's more than fun Visual Studio. Yeah, it's a thing. Um, Visual Studio Code is what we in the, the web development community know and a lot of people use. Um, but this is open source, and this was actually forked from Adam, the Adam uh, uh, code editor. Uh, and it's based on Electron, and it's cross-platform. But then there's Visual Studio proper, and this this has existed for a very long time, and it used to only be for Windows. I mean, it still technically is, but now they have Visual Studio for Mac, which is like Visual Studio, but actually installs on a Mac. But it also has an interesting history because um, this is actually like mono develop, and we'll talk about .NET and how it technically only used to work on Windows, but there was also this open source thing called Mono that let you run .NET code in non-Windows environments. And to work on that, you use Mono Develop. There, there's, a, there's a very rich history here. But uh, let me tell you about, uh, <laughs> let me tell you, today I learned VS Code was forked from Adam, says TD Racing. Yeah, they're the one that mentioned, uh, uh, they didn't know there were multiple. Um, Yes, and you can you can use Visual Studio for web dev. I, I mean, I did it in my in my past career. Uh, these days, I just use Visual Studio Code. Yeah. Okay. Here <laughs> we're gonna do the badges now. Um, hopefully, if they pop up, here they are. So, uh, if you go to this web page, the Font Awesome Brand Cheat Sheet, um, you can pick any anything from here um, and set it as uh, an icon in your chat messages. Um, because we're doing it, I'm going to do Microsoft because .NET, C Sharp, it's, uh, it's Microsoft. So once you've picked a team name, you can do exclamation mark team followed by that name. And then all of your messages will have that nice little icon on it. <laughs> no! <laughs> uh, SQL Gordster has the, uh, the maple, maple leaf and the Canadian flag. Very nice. Um, so you two can set that. Unrelated. Nightbot command? Oh, I don't know, but I do know that Streamlabs bot, like the cloud bot, has its own syntax for like taking in arguments. I don't really use it that much, but maybe you can look into that. Look into cloud bot. Okay, uh, so uh, Ma, you can set your team. Great. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, Marco Dev, uh, you might have unfollowed. <laughs> Um, images, I think user images don't show up for users that aren't following, I think. Is that a thing? It is a thing. Or is it? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, thank you for the follow. <laughs> I feel like you, you were following. It, it's, uh, it's irrelevant. But, uh, now your image will show up in, oh, no, no, no worries. Now it's going to take 30 minutes before your image shows up. Yeah. <laughs> um... 
Okay, what were we doing? There's a lot of chat messages. I need to tell you how to set your country flag, which is not uh, which is not hard. You can do exclamation mark country followed by your two character country code like that, and that'll set your uh, your country flag. All right, let me let me read some messages. Your badge is view. Look at that. Yeah, this will be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, but uh, I will for for those of you that are newer to Twitch, you can watch all of my. Um, VODs from the past 60 days on Twitch. So if you go to coding uh, twitch.tv slash coding garden slash videos, um, even this stream that's happening right now, you can actually watch the first 23 minutes of. Uh, so when this is when this stream is over, you can go here and watch the VOD, and then in about a month or so, it'll be on YouTube. Yeah. Do I for Visual Studio or Code? I like Code. It's, it's fast. I know, like, Visual Studio proper is a beast like it's gigabytes to install um whereas uh visual studio code is just like a 100 megabyte download or so uh i mean but visual studio is a full-fledged i keep i'm making hand motions it's a full-fledged uh uh development environment comes with a lot built in yeah, and so that's the main difference. Like Visual Studio has been around for a long time and has a ton of stuff built in. Visual Studio Code is much more pared down, and to get similar functionality, you, you install extensions. So yeah, that's a thing. Uh, I always knew VS Code came after Atom and was based on Lexion, but I didn't know it was now. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was a proper fork. I know it, it, there's something, there's some history there. <laughs> uh, no, the pronouns, I'll show you how to set those in a second. Uh, but there there actually is a Twitch extension that will let you set pronouns. I just don't know what it is. Yeah, Acid Spark used to work in uh, ASP. Um, I mean, I, I spent like five years of my life doing nothing but C Sharp. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It has been a long time. Is there a way to log the hours a friend has in a game through code through stream? Oh. <laughs> I think uh, Steam has some sort of API that'll tell you like how many hours a game has been played. I think that's a thing. What's up, uh, Naranjo? Welcome to the show. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, do I recommend making cross-platform desktop apps? Yeah, I think if it's uh, if you know web development already, like if you know JavaScript and stuff like that, it's really easy to make a desktop app with Electron. Uh, but yeah, there's issues of like uses too much memory, it has its own copy of Chromium, all that, all that stuff that people like to complain about. Um, but if you already know web development, it's a really easy way to make a desktop app. If you know C Sharp, you could make a Windows-specific desktop app. <laughs> um, though I do, I, the, so um, uh, I know Microsoft did acquire Xamarin, and I know that there's a way now maybe to create like cross-platform desktop apps with C Sharp. It's probably no longer called Xamarin. I don't know, I'm out of the loop. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you all for that hype train. Um, what else am I going to say? Uh, I'll click on this because Chad is a is a good friend of the coding card. <laughs> um, what was I going to do? Oh, yeah. I'm going to tell you how to set. Well, I, I told you how to set your country tag. I'm going to show you how to uh, set your pronouns. So uh, in the chat, you can see like Mark has his pronoun, preferred pronouns to, to set to he, him, his. Uh, who else? Uh, Marco has their set to that as well. Uh, so you two can set your preferred pronouns, just so I know. Uh, these these are your options. You can do she, he, zay, they, ko, nun, zay, hi, it, one, em, or yo. Um, and then uh, in the chat, you can do exclamation mark pronoun followed by the one that you prefer, just like uh, Airmo just did. And your pronouns will show up in your chat messages. Um, I know Xamarin was mobile. I feel like they there's a similar technology that's also for desktop. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. Did I hear about Vue 3? Is there something new about Vue 3? <laughs> I've done some streams on uh, on Vue 3. Um, um, I can search it here. View. View. Yeah, so I did some streams a while back about the composition API and stuff like that. I I don't mean WPF. I don't. <laughs> but so uh, I, I don't believe WPF is cross-platform yet, unless they've been working on that. 
Maui. That's what I'm talking. Thank you, Harry. That's it. Maui is the thing. It's like cross-platform desktop development or something like that. Or Maui is what now with the... I mean, does it matter? I don't know if it even matters. <laughs> but uh, .NET Core cross-platform desktop app. Um, let's see what we got. UI frameworks. Oh, so like they're combining ASP.NET and Electron. You don't want that. I mean, you maybe you do, <laughs> but um, Alvaria ETO forms. Like some of the, some of these might be an implementation of WinForms that works cross platform. Oh, here we go. A cross platform XAML framework for .NET. But this is not owned by Microsoft. Interesting. Doesn't matter. We're not even going to be talking about desktop development today. So <laughs> let's keep moving. Um, let's say thanks to all the people because I appreciate you. Wow. Lots of support. Um, thank you to DJCJ or DJCJ <laughs> for the 500 bits. It has been a long time. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Tim, for that six month prime resub. MB Dealer with the 11 month resub. Frankie, too, with the five months. Julian with 100 bits. And Colloquial Owl uh, with that three month resub who's looking forward to the stream. That's good. I feel like a lot of people are. There are a lot of people here. You just mentioned .NET, C Sharp. Everybody gets interested. <laughs> um,. No, I, I do I do a lot of different things. I just like I like JavaScript the most, which is why I do it on stream because the things I do on stream are typically the things that I like. Um, so yeah, but uh, I mentioned it earlier. I did C sharp for like five years. Okay, um, I probably missed some messages. Sorry about that. We are going to get started pretty soon. Am I missing anything? Let's all play the drop game. <laughs> just type exclamation mark drop me in the chat. And uh, your avatar will fall from the sky. Also, we got some um, we got some more newbies. Who else is here? Uh, frankly Delicious. What's up? First timer. Welcome. Uh, yeah, VS Code is built with Electron. Uh, maybe they have their own. Well, look at all the drops. Uh, maybe they have their own fork of it. I, but I'm pretty sure it's mainly Electron. Uh, Stahl Pringle. Hello. Yeah, I do work at a company. Uh, what's up, Marish <laughs> Uh What's up, Albaku? Uh, in games for the win. And Joe, it has been a while. Is this your first time sending a Twitch message? <laughs> I remember your name. was. Do I remember your name from YouTube? I don't know. And what's up, Nopley? Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's get into it. No, 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 it's fine. Uh, there's a, you, you did not derail my stream. <laughs> there's a lot going on. <laughs> um. We always get derailed. And like I said, this is not a straightforward tutorial. We're, we're going to go on an adventure together to do something that I've done before but haven't done in a tutorial style. So, well, thank you, Data Frittata. Uh, shout out to um, Instafluff. The original, so Instafluff created the original drop game. I made my own version, uh, but definitely check him out. <laughs> Derailing CJ101. Say something. Exactly. <laughs> Um, uh, Legacy Sharp is relative, well, actually, no, because um, I'll say one of the apps I'm working on at work right now, uh, we're taking a Legacy VB app, Visual Basic VB.net app, and actually, we're not even touching it, but we're, <laughs> we're implementing an API that interfaces with the database that that Visual Basic app talks to. So... Yeah, and we're also not replacing it. They, they exist alongside. But regardless, let's get started. So um, you're all here. This is what you've all been waiting for. We're going to write some C Sharp, and it's going to be pretty fun. Um, so first up, we need to set up our environment. Uh, now, to just talk about this from a, 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 an extreme beginner's perspective, um, if we want to write C Sharp code, we need... Um, the C Sharp uh, software development kit, the SDK. We need we need the runtime to be able to do it. Um, just like when you're writing um, JavaScript backends, you need to install Node.js to, to be able to run that. It's a very similar idea. You need the .NET Core SDK to be able to write C Sharp .NET apps on your computer. So the first step is to install it. Um, and let's do it. Download the .NET Core. 
here we are. I'm going to hide my screen and uh, going to install it. Yeah, and you can see when you go to this page, um, .NET 6.0 is currently in preview. Um, I'm just going to use 5.0, which is the latest, well, not um, 5.0.7. It's the latest stable stuff. Wow. Okay, so I'm going to download it and then just run the installer. Actually, I'll show you this page because because it's pretty complicated. Let's figure out which one we need. Um, yeah, so you'll see, you'll often see the two different things. You have the SDK, which allows you to build apps. So this is the software development kit. It includes everything needed to be able to compile uh, .NET uh, C sharp programs. Whereas the runtime is what's needed to actually run the code. So uh, if we were deploying this API that we built with the SDK to some server, that server doesn't need the SDK because that server likely isn't doing any compiling or building of the things, it's just running it. So that server would need the runtime installed on it. Um, typically, if it's a Windows server, it's running an IIS, and then they have a, a .NET Core add-on that lets you run .NET Core apps inside of IIS. Um, you also could just straight run the compiled program on a Linux machine that has the, the .NET Core runtime running on it. But we're writing software. We want the SDK. Uh, and I'm just going to grab the, the latest 5.0.301. Um, I'm trying to tell the difference between these two. This is just a later release, and I'm on a Mac, and I'm going to grab the installer. Here we go. I'm going to download it and run it. Um... Yeah, so someone asked, can you install the SDK with a uh, package manager? Like, there's probably a way to do it with Homebrew or something like that. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm laughing at Doc's message. But the but I would say use their official installer um, because it's official. <laughs> um, but here, I'll, I'll uh, well, actually... Yeah, I'll let you see the install process. So this is basically like it's it's installing some stuff. Like I probably could get the binaries, put them into a specific folder, but this is going to do a lot of setup for me. Like very specifically, uh, it's going to um, install all the things that I need and then also install some things into my path variable. So that way in the terminal, I can use the .NET, um, .NET command to build and, and generate projects and stuff like that. Um, so let's install it. Oh yeah, let me let me mention what Doc Doc said though. Um, it's, is it the first step to carefully read and accept the terms of the Microsoft.NET framework and user license agreement? Probably. Well, I think technically I just clicked past uh, the user the user agreement. Um, but yes, you do have to do that. Um, cool. All right, so we got it installed. Uh, we should be able to go from here. I, I am going to pull up this tutorial because this uh, this is from uh, the Microsoft website's documentation that tells you how to install it. Uh, we downloaded it. Um, let me see if there's any extra steps. Yeah, you, it, and they show you how to do a manual install. Um, installing alongside Visual Studio Code. All right, we have Visual Studio Code. We installed it. We now need the C Sharp extension inside, inside of VS Code. Uh, I might already have it, but let's see. We're just going to search for C-sharp. What's it called? I can search for C-sharp. Here it is. Oh, I don't have it. Cool. So um, Visual Studio Code, out of the box, uh, wouldn't know what to do with a C-sharp file. Like, for example, if I create, like, person.cs. Oh, actually, it might already have some syntax highlighting. Um, Oh, yeah, look at that. It's got some basic syntax highlighting. But um, after I install this, we're going to get a ton of editor support. So uh, one of the uh, very nice and interesting things about um, a statically typed language like C Sharp is that your editor can provide a ton of uh, hints uh, for you whenever you're writing your code because it knows what all of your types are. It can, it can statically analyze all of your code, uh, which is very different from... Uh, JavaScript. Uh, it's this is it, the that idea is similar to how in TypeScript you can get very specific uh, suggestions about like what methods you can call and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna install this. 
CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete. API is an application programming interface. We're going to create a web API, which is an application programming interface that's accessible over the web. Uh, and that API is going to allow us, allow us to create, read, update, and delete data from a database. Um, cannot be located. Let's see. I might have to restart. Um, I'm going to restart VS Code. Now that I have the .NET Core, it is a, it is a lot of words, <laughs> which is why I can't, can't explain everything from scratch uh, because there's a lot of uh, prerequisites here. Uh, should we use .NET in 2021? It's pretty slick, and I'm gonna. Sh I'll I'll show you. I'm like we're also gonna be setting up Swagger, and one of the nice things about a strongly typed language is that all of these models that I define can instantly be turned into Swagger Open API documentation, which is a little bit trickier to do with just like Node. I don't know. Um, Okay, we have it installed. Uh, do I have a .NET command? It's not found there, but if I open a new tab, let's see if we have a .NET command. Yes, okay, so that means it worked. So I, I ran that installer, the, the one that I clicked on and clicked through. That now gives me this .NET command, and I can use this command to generate projects and also compile projects and stuff like that. Um, so uh, we have installed the SDK, wonderful thing. Uh, someone did mention earlier, uh, they were like, I always got confused about like an S like SDK versus um, the runtime, all that good stuff. Oh well, well, I missed it. That's okay. <laughs> um, is C sharp better and faster than Node? It's relative. <laughs> it depends on what you're doing. Uh, I would say development time is potentially longer in a statically typed language because you do have to create types for everything. Um, and uh, there's a lot of code up front. Whereas with Node and just plain JavaScript, you can get away with a lot of things without having to create interfaces and, and stuff like that because it's, uh, it's dynamically typed. Um, that said, using a statically typed language will potentially catch some errors ahead, uh, like before they even come you even come across them which you don't necessarily get with uh, node and javascript but yeah can i use jscript.net if my website ends in .com i don't know doc <laughs> All right, so we've installed the SDK. That's great. Let's just talk about what this thing is first. Okay, so uh, I mentioned the .NET framework. Um, this has existed for uh, a long time. This was um, initially released in 2002. It's almost 20 years. Wow. Um, and the, the idea with the .NET framework um, is it, it provides the .NET run time. So this is essentially a program you install on a computer, and that program is able to run .NET, um, .NET programs, so things built with the .NET, .NET framework. Um, and so you can see in their little di diagram here, like there's a lot of different things you can, you can build that all run on this common language runtime, all run within the, uh, the .NET framework. Um, and so yeah, there's a lot more to it. You can look up <laughs> Uh, the Wikipedia page here to learn about the .NET framework. But in uh, 2016, a very interesting thing happened. Uh, the .NET Core was released as an open source package. Because actually, it, uh, this is important to know, it used to be the .NET framework was proprietary. Um, it, it, it's, it was by Microsoft. Um, they technically did have, a, it's tied to a specification, I believe. Um, but Microsoft themselves wrote the specification and then implemented the specification. Um, that may be that may be wrong. Maybe that applies to the uh, that definitely applies to the C sharp language. I don't know if it necessarily applies to the dot framework dot net framework. But regardless, it was completely closed source. You could only uh, run it on uh, Windows officially or whoever wherever whatever they built it to run on. And um, yeah, it was very it was closed source. It didn't work on Linux or on Mac. Um, and, uh, there were other things that allowed you to run programs compiled for the .NET framework on systems that couldn't run the .NET framework. So there was this thing called, uh, Mono. I'm going to search Wikipedia for Mono. Let's see what happens. Cool. It goes to the, the disambiguation. Uh, we were specifically looking for in technology and programming. 
an open source implementation of the CLR, the Common Language Runtime. So back in the day, if you wanted to run .NET programs on Linux, you had to use this. And this was a completely open source implementation, not at all related to the, the Microsoft implementation. Um, and uh, some things worked, but not all things worked. But then, like I was about to mention a second ago, a beautiful thing happened in 2016. Uh, Microsoft has decided to um, make the .NET framework open source. Uh, not the whole thing, but specifically the core, um, and also make it um, cross-platform. So... Um, that it could, you could install the .NET runtime on a Linux machine or on Mac, and that same .NET code could run across all of them. Um, and uh, fun fact, I was actually there when uh, when Anders uh, clicked the the Make Public button on the .NET Core uh, project, or was it was like Roslyn or something like that? Anybody remember? Was it, was it Code Project? What, what was what was the website that people used to use to to host? projects before GitHub was really big. Um, it's not Code Project. Code Project is this. Codeplex, that's it. Codeplex, thank you. Yeah, Codeplex. Um, so yeah, I was at Microsoft Build 2016, um, and uh, the .NET Core was hosted on Codeplex, which is, I guess, no longer a thing. It was shut down. <laughs> but uh, live, Anders actually clicked Make Public Publish uh, on the, the .NET Core repo. Uh, and so that was the start of where we are today. The fact that I am on a Mac computer about to write some C-sharp code, it, it all started back in 2016. Um, and that was the initial release. Now we're here in 2021. I'm using .NET 5. .NET 6 will, will be released pretty soon. Um, but that's the thing. So so now, I mean, and there's a long history. There's a long history. Um, all that to say, these days, you can write code for the .NET framework that will run anywhere that uh, the .NET runtime can run, and these days it can run um, most places. It can run on Mac, it can run on uh, Windows, it can run on Linux. Great. Um, now let's talk about like the specifics of what this, what what it means to be a common language runtime. Basically, uh, you can write your code in a few different languages. Like C# -sharp is the main one. Typically, when you hear C# -sharp, that's what's associated with .NET. There's also Visual Basic .NET, VB .NET. In F sharp, which is like a functional programming language, um, but all three of these languages will, when you compile them, they get compiled into the CIL, Common Intermediate Language. And so this this CIL, this Common Intermediate Language, is actually what is um, run by the runtime itself. So you can so you can take this uh, this built file that is the Common Intermediate Language, and if you put it on a Linux system that's running the .NET uh, runtime, it can interpret that and then um, run it on the specific system. So it, it translates it into actual machine code that can run, uh, and that's what that's what allows uh, it to be like cross-platform because your compiled code is this intermediate language thing, and then that intermediate language can be brought to any system. But then that specific system has something that can be that can uh, run it and interpret it on that specific system. Uh, yeah, it's it's very very similar to Java's uh, virtual machine. Uh, actually, they they stole the idea from Java. <laughs> yeah. So in short, it is the JVM for C sharp, definitely. Uh, and there are other languages. These three are listed here, but there's also like I think Iron Python is a thing, right? Is it still a thing? It used to be a thing. Yeah. So Iron Python basically allows you to uh, run Python on top of the the .NET runtime. Um, and there are, there, are, there are other things as well that will let you basically compile your code to CIL and then allow that to run anywhere that the .NET framework can run. So this isn't super important to know, but it is pretty interesting. Um, and one of the caveats, I've talked about this before, but the fact that it's in this intermediate language actually means that it can be uh, reversed fairly easily. So it's actually fairly easy to take a compiled uh, .NET program and turn it back into source code, which is not the best thing and is usually illegal according to whatever terms of whatever software you're doing that to, but it is possible. Um, just like Java. Yeah. Um, cool. And then the language itself, so what we're writing our code in is we're going to be using C Sharp. Um, it's a statically typed language. It's very similar to Java, but uh, more forward thinking, I guess, <laughs> has more features. Um, Though, like, all the features that C-sharp gets, Java slowly gets, like, a year or two later. Um, so that's a thing. 
All right. I think we're done talking about the history of it. Any any comments or questions about the uh, the history of .NET C Sharp before we get into this? Sorry. Uh, before I did .NET Core for cross platform or .NET Standard for Windows. Now it's all yeah. So um, and it, it used to be like yeah, if you were running for Windows, you would you would do this. But now they're they're consolidating it so that everything runs under the .NET Core, which is cross platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a comment. Oh, oh Lord, who would want that? I mean, the, the main reason is so that the code is portable, right? So you have this common intermediate language that, uh, can be compiled once to, it's not like a low level binary. It's a higher level binary that can then run on any system that has the runtime. That's why they do it to allow for like cross platform. So, yeah. So do I need .NET 5 or .NET Core 3.1? So uh, .NET Core 3.1 is, wait, actually, oh, okay, I wasn't even aware of that. There is a naming fiasco. <laughs> I guess .NET, yeah, oh, wow. They they really need to work on their naming here. But yeah, that that is actually what you want because .NET 5 is .NET Core, but I believe it has, it's replacing .NET Framework. That's what somebody was talking about. Yeah, because... I'll say this, .NET 5 is is the .NET Core, as far as I'm concerned, right? <laughs> Somebody can tell me if I'm wrong, but as far as I'm concerned, it, it is. Would I use TypeScript.NET if that was a thing? No. I feel like C Sharp is a beautiful language. Um, I would much rather use C Sharp over, over TypeScript. Okay, I missed a lot of stuff. That's okay. Um... You'll you'll be able to create a .NET Core API with only three lines when .NET 6 gets released, just like Node and Express. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's take a quick stretch. It's the good part of Java with the simplicity of C and not the complexity of Java. I mean, I don't know. Java and C Sharp are very similar. Very similar. If any Java devs are watching, this code is going to look very similar to you. And what's up, one computer guy? Yeah, we talked about Mono a, a bit ago. It's it, it's it's all a very interesting history because uh, Mono uh, was created by Miguel. What's his last name? Miguel, wasn't it? Miguel de uh, de Acasa, who is huge in the open source community. He also uh, created GNOME, which is the like the the Linux uh, desktop environment. I believe. Yeah, look at that. He's a creator of that. Uh, and he created Mono, which is not at all associated with Microsoft, but it was an open source implementation. And then he also created Xamarin, which was that open source... Uh, I didn't want to do that. Um, open source way of creating cross-platform um, uh, mobile apps in C Sharp. But he got hired by Microsoft. They basically acquired Xamarin. They hired Miguel. Uh, and now they've incorporated all uh, most of that stuff into the .NET Core, which is, which is all pretty interesting. Okay, and so apparently it's not the .NET Core anymore. <laughs> it's just .NET 5. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, welcome, uh, TNG. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so there used, like, the, 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 the difference between .NET Core and .NET Framework used to be that .NET Framework was specific to Windows. It was not open source. And the .NET Core was the open source piece of it that could run cross-platform. Now, I believe .NET Framework has gone away. It's like all what was .NET Core, but now it's just called .NET 5. Basically, if you're writing .NET stuff, use .NET 5. That's, I think that's the, the, the sum, sum of it all. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Mikhail Diacasa, yeah, 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 yeah. That man, he definitely he definitely programs. <laughs> he's, he's like an open source god. Cool. All right. That's a great, that was a fun history lesson. Thanks for everyone for participating. Let's actually create a project now. Um, but before we do that, let's uh, thank the people that have uh, supported. Uh, Timon, or Timon, for the 10 months, can I explain how to get web components going? Um, I'll give you a 20-second answer. <laughs> so um, there are, there are, a lot of uh, libraries out there that will help you with writing web components. Um, one of the main ones is um, lit. 
lit HTML, what used to be lit HTML. But basically, this is a little JavaScript library that makes it very easy to build web components and work with web components. You don't necessarily need this, but it will make your life a lot easier. They have um, all these interesting things like decorators. Um, they have this uh, uh, template function that allows you to pass a string into it but then it actually gets compiled into a, a renderable and updatable template, very similar to JSX, but you can see that it's all like JavaScript-y. Um, so yeah, t check out Lit. There's also a Stencil. Why can't just search for Stencil? Uh, Stencil.js, yeah. Which is similar uh, in that it's a library that lets you write web components, um, but this one you actually can use JSX with if you look at its documentation. Um, so I would say start with either one of those. What's up, CM Griffin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then um, just like those things let you write web components directly, uh, what CM Griffin has mentioned is um, you could use Angular and then you could target web components. Like you could build your code to be a web component with Angular elements. Um, I think there are similar plugins for React. You can do a, a similar thing with, uh, with Vue. Um, and then if you don't want to do any of that, you can literally just write the code. <laughs> Because um, if you look at um, the documentation for web components, the main thing is you're implementing a class. Uh, you're implementing a custom element. So you, you have a class that uh, inherits from HTML div element, um, and then you use this to define it. So this this what this line of code right here is doing is it's defining a custom element called word count. So on in your HTML, when uh, it detects that you're using an element called word count the browser is actually going to create an instance of this class that you created. Um, and, and this code that we're looking at right here is supported directly in browsers that support web components. You don't need a, like an external library for it. At the end of the day, though, um, if you use those other libraries, it's going to compile or transpile down into that. OK, thank you for the question. And Fab, thank you for the eight months. Sorale with the 15 months. OK, not now with the gift. Thank you for that gift. Uh, F Society with a five-month resub. Yeah, C-sharp, uh, planning on giving a demo about Blazor. Uh, I was saying maybe another time, because um, we're basically just building a JSON API. There is no server-side rendering. It takes in JSON and returns JSON. And Nookie Poo, thank you for that 12-month Prime resub. Much appreciated. It was more than 20 seconds, but I think it was fine. <laughs> Uh, and Unhot, thank you for the 15 months. Uh, I hope to release an initial version of a big code or education project. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to take a look when it gets released. Yeah, and thank you, CM Griffin, for the support. 13 months. Wow. Okay. Let's make a project. So now that you know uh, the, um, the rough history of .NET and C Sharp, let's make a project with it. Um, and before we do that, we're going to take a quick aside and answer this question <laughs> that, um, that Chad asked earlier that I totally forgot to look at. So let's look at it. Uh, which would I prefer to get a mapped value? So a switch statement. So you have a, um, a header that you're trying to get. If it's a specific header, you call a method. OK. Do an object lookup. Yeah. And and thanks for being here, Fuzzy Life. Who says they're they're not a JS developer, so they usually just nod. <laughs> um, but they say they're finally going to be able to understand stuff, which is good. Um, I don't I don't know, Chad. I think so. This one looks a little bit nicer, like there's less code. But the thing to think about here is that technically you're calling all of the methods. I don't know what the implication of that is. Like it's probably it might just be returning a string. It's probably nothing complicated. But to compare it, like here you're calling this many methods, whereas here you only call the method if you need that specific header. Um so I might do it a different way. <laughs> uh, I mean, what I might do is I would map uh these to the name of the um the name of the method that I'm trying to call. And then once I have the name of the method, I, you could dynamically call that from headers. That's the one that I would go with. Yeah. 
So yeah, so something like what Mark is suggesting. So basically, you would you would index into this, get like the word content type or the word last modified in in the exact formatting that is the method name, and then you use that to dynam dynamically invoke that method. Yeah. Okay, that was a fun aside. Let's generate a project. So, um, you can ignore everything that I've talked about so far. Just know that I'm on a Mac. I have the .NET uh, runtime installed. It's called the .NET SDK installed. I mean, technically, we should we should remove the word core from all the stuff. Can can whoever updated the overlay name? Can you remove the word core so it just says .NET plus C sharp? Uh, we're running on a Mac. It's cross platform. It's a beautiful thing. Um, now, <laughs> just forget about the first hour of the stream. This is where we start coding. So we need to we need to generate a project, um, and so. Uh, the, the Microsoft docs for this are actually pretty great. I mean, this is a, a literal tutorial on how to make a CRUD API for to-dos. So we could just follow this and we'd be done. Um, but we are going to be doing a lot more than just this because this is like the basic API. But we're also going to be talking to an actual database. Um, we're going to be setting up authentication. We're going to be setting up Swagger. So we're going to be a bit more in-depth than this. But we are going to use this as a basis. Um, so we're using Visual Studio Code. We have all of the prerequisites. Let's create a project. Um, so in the terminal, I need to run this command, .NET new web API, and then I can name it. Um, I'm not going to use MongoDB. I'm actually going to use Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, just to make things even more weird, I'm going to have Microsoft SQL Server running in a Docker container on a Mac um, that our, our .NET API is talking to. Um, OK, so we need to generate an app. We're going to run this command uh, in the folder, but we need to name it. Um, what are what are we going to be? <laughs> we're going to be what are we going to be crudding? Create, read, update, delete. Um, uh, th just throw out some nouns like we could we could have a database of of beers. We could have a database of I mean, we could do Pokemon cards, but we've done too much stuff with Pokemon cards. Um, just, just give me random nouns. Just throw them in the chat. Random nouns. Yeah, pain. <laughs> um, but aim higher is asking about my chair. Um, I actually got this from work, but it, it is uh, an IKEA Marcus chair, and it is yeah. I mean, I you've seen me potentially. You've seen me do. I've done like seventeen hour streams before, and this chair was just fine. So I like it. Yeah, it works. It works well. Beans, butterflies, garden plants, peanut butter, stamps, anime characters, cats, fishes, spaghetti, uh, chocolate, soccer teams, trees, storms, banana, football player, <laughs> the home inventory app. Uh, we could do a database of cats. Recipe. Let's do recipes. That that's uh that's relevant to me right now because actually. <laughs> Hashtag not sponsored. I, I started doing HelloFresh. Um, and I cooked my first meal with it yesterday. It was pretty good. And they basically ship you all the ingredients in the in the recipe. So we're gonna do we're gonna do a database of recipes. Um here we go. <laughs> so uh, the name of our uh, API is going to be uh, recipes API. So um, is that how they did it? Lowercase. I don't know if it matters. So this will generate a project. It's going to be called Recipes API. Let's go. So welcome to .NET 5. All right. Looks like there's some te telemetry stuff. Uh, they installed some stuff. They created the template. And there we go. So uh, you can't see it very well, but that uh, created a folder um, called Recipes API. I'm actually going to hide the topic overlay because that's all we're doing today is .NET stuff. So that's awesome. We have a, we have a folder. It's got an app inside of it. Uh, let's go. Um, the project template creates a... Wait, what? Oh, the project template creates a weather forecast API. That's interesting. We need to trust the HTTPS development certificate. That's also super interesting. So... In the Node.js world, when we're when we're building a um, uh, a Node app, typically we just run it under HTTP. I believe this is going to try to run it under HTTPS by default, which is fine, but it's also cumbersome because you have to like uh, 
allow the cell sign certificate, that kind of thing. I'm going to not run this command for now, and we'll see what happens. Um, I think you forgot some steps. <laughs> no, I think I think we'll be fine. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 uh, it adds the in-memory database. Not too worried about that just yet. I'm going to start it up, uh, but let's take a look at it. So this is what it generated. Uh, we can see we have program.cs. This is going to be our entry point. Um, the .NET Core SDK cannot be located. Oh, I need this. .NET SDK for Visual Studio Code. So I think I need this. Wait, does this the thing I got earlier, though? Give me a second. Yeah, this is the exact same thing I downloaded earlier. So apparently I'm just missing something to link it. So I, I did download the extension. I got the C sharp extension. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to uh, reload the window and then see if it um, if it picks it up. No, I installed the extension after the SDK. Um, I can't can't zoom out. <laughs> there we go. Okay. But I can't read what's on the buttons. I need to see what's on the buttons. <laughs> I, we have the .NET Core. Um, how do I set the path of the .NET Core? We'll search for it. Um, VS Code .NET Core path. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good point, Doc, but I thought I did that because technically, yeah, so right now the .NET core, .NET command is found, and if I open up VS, oh, no, I, I CD'd into the, um, here, okay. Now if I open this up with code, see if it makes a difference. Oh, yeah, yeah. Apparently I had opened it before in a different terminal. That fixed it. Yeah, that fixed it. Thank you, Doc. Uh, so that was the main issue. Earlier when I opened code, wherever that was, the .NET command was not recognized yet. And now it is. Great. OK, this is our entry point. Um, it has a main method. It's going to run our program. Um, and then the other thing we can look at is uh, startup.cs. Um, so this is where a lot of the configuration is set up as well. So it adds all of our controllers. Apparently, it's already uh, giving us a, a Swagger documentation uh, by default. Um, yeah, we're getting the Swagger page. And apparently, by default, it is a recipes API. So we look at the controllers. Wait. Oh, no, no, never mind. <laughs> I called it recipes API. It's a weather forecast thing. So if we look at this controller, this is basically like a, a router in Node.js. This is where all of the routes are defined. Um, and so this has all of the different types of weather. And then specifically, this right here is the one HTTP method that it implements. So this is a, uh, a git uh, request handler. So when a git request comes into this server, this is how it responds. It just comes up with a random uh, weather forecast. Let's run it. So uh, in this folder, I should be able to do .NET run. .NET run, and it'll compile it. Um, so I mentioned it earlier, but uh, this is a uh, 
uh, compiled language, meaning that we have to compile it into the intermediate language before it can actually run, which is very different from like a, a plain old Node.js JavaScript project where essentially the Node runtime interprets the JavaScript code like at runtime. Cool. Yeah, and, and I'll show that in a second. So like basically this compiles it once and then runs it. Um, but if I change my code, I technically would have to kill it and then rerun it. But just like uh, Steph uh, Beckers is mentioning, they, they have a, a watch command, which will basically recompile it anytime your code changes. Uh, but let's see if it worked. Yeah, so uh, it is on HTTPS by default, which is fine because we can just accept the risk and um, load the site without the certificate. Now what's happening? Not found. Oh, yeah, of course not, because there's no... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one thing I don't like by default is um, uh, this doesn't have, like, a default error page. Technically, this is a 404, and my server is responding, but, yeah, just like Nookie Poo is mentioning, we actually need to go to the route itself, um, which should be the name of the controller. So that's usually how this thing, these things get set up. Basically, you have your controllers here, those are automatically picked up because they're in that folder, and then they use the name of the controller to determine what the routes should, should be. So uh, because this controller is called weather forecast controller, I should be able to go to slash weather forecast to get the results, yeah. Um, great, so that endpoint is working, um, and then also it, we can go to Swagger, and we can see the, the Swagger documentation, which is also pretty sweet. This gets generated by default, um, and we can we can test it out get back the data just like we saw. It's a beautiful thing. All right, we have ourselves an API. Uh, now we need to set up a database that we can that we can actually talk to. Um, and I am, and this is the point where I stop following this tutorial because they do a bunch of other stuff. Um, but first, a moment, on, a note on um, packages. So in the Node.js and JavaScript world, we have uh, NPM. Um, it's a beautiful thing. People can host packages here. You can install packages from here. In uh, the .NET world, they have a very similar thing. It's just called uh, NuGet. And so uh, if there is an existing package that has some functionality that I want to bring into my app, um, I can search here and then install it into my project. Um, specifically, the, the dependency we're going to be installing is the Entity Framework, um, because this is a library for uh, working with a database. It's going to allow us to uh, create database models, and then actually automatically generate the migrations and automatically create the tables uh, for those models that we create. So let's do it. Nougat, yeah. <laughs> uh, and David is asking, what extension do I use for JSON? Well, uh, this is actually built into Firefox, uh, the one that I just showed. I used to use a different one, um, but then when I updated my browser, I didn't switch it. Um, this is the built-in JSON viewer in Firefox. But also, I want to fix, honestly, before we move on, I want to fix this. The fact that we just get a blank page um, whenever I, there should, we should be seeing an error, like I'm getting no feedback. There's actually a way to turn on uh, like error pages. And let me just do that really quick. Um, and actually, let's see if I can figure it out. Um, this is the nice thing about a statically typed language. Uh, the moment I start typing, it can give me suggestions. And these are these are all valid suggestions. Like any one of these are methods that I could call. Um, and is there something about... Error messages? I'll have to, I'll have to search for it. It's something like this. Oh, use developer exception page. That's the one. Okay, so this is what I want. And I actually only want that to run if we are in development. Use developer exception page. But now that I've done that, uh, if we go to something that doesn't exist, I should get an error. But like I mentioned earlier, every time you change the code, you have to recompile. Um, so I could kill it and then run .NET run. But if I do .NET watch run, now this will always uh, automatically recompile anytime the code changes. But this should do it. And now if I go here, it didn't, it didn't work. 
Um, did I do it right? Oh, well, there it was already there. Use developer exception page. Never mind. It's just not running. Yeah, it was already there. Use status code pages. That might be it, Akar. Let's see. So app.use status. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Okay. Because that's what's happening right now. There isn't there isn't an exception, but there is a 404 status that we want to see. Okay, so I changed the code. Uh, recompiled. And now... And now... Nice. Uh, that's a little bit better. <laughs> At least I get some feedback. Um, status code is not bound. Okay. Regardless, let's start working on the on the database. Um, so we're going to be using Entity Framework, Entity Framework Core, um, and it's a pretty it's a pretty cool thing. So um, the idea with this specific library is you create classes. Now, I realize I haven't talked at all about the actual C sharp syntax, um, but essentially, I mean, a, a class here is somewhat similar to a class in JavaScript. It's basically like a blueprint for an object. Um, and what Entity Framework allows you to do is to create these um, these classes. So this is saying, I have a blog. A blog has an ID, a URL, and a rating. It also has a list of posts. And then a post has an ID, title, content, and um, uh, it's related to a specific blog. So basically what you can do with Entity Framework is you define your models like this, and then it will automatically generate the, the SQL code to create a table that will store data for this, uh, create the, um, I guess you don't really need a join table here. This just has the, the related ID. Um, but it does all of that automatically if we do it code first. And so that's what we're going to do. And then after that, you get some cool syntax to actually query the database. So you can say database.tableName. Uh, where, and then pass in a Lambda function, um, and also like order by and any of the other things that you might want to do, and then that will automatically give you back uh, the data from the database. And all of this, in turn, gets turned into SQL code that's running against the data database. Uh, and yeah, and so this is an ORM. This is an object relational mapper. It's taking um, our objects here and then mapping them to uh, SQL code or a relational type code. So uh, let's get it going. We need to install it. Um, the Entity Framework Tools for Visual Studio. We don't have Visual Studio. We do want the runtime. Copper Beardy, what's up, friend? Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so uh, I need to install uh, Entity Framework. Why? Why? This is telling me to use PowerShell. <laughs> can, can I get the command for... Um, yeah, I need Entity Framework. Oh, here it is. You're right. You're totally right, Brooklyn Dev. Thank you. Getting started. Here it is. I, I actually had the wrong link. Let me update that. Yeah, I mean, surprisingly, these Microsoft Docs are actually pretty good. <laughs> um, uh, it, it has everything we need um, to get going. Okay, so get the runtime. This is what I want. Um, wait, what? Why am I adding SQL Server? I guess this is fine because I am going to be talking to Microsoft SQL Server, but I believe there are other ones you can install, like if you wanted to talk to a MySQL database or a Postgres database. Um, but let's add it. So I'm going to kill this. I'm in the folder for my recipes API, and I'm going to add this specific package. Uh, this is very similar to like npm install. Uh, basically what it's going to do is there is a, um, I believe the project file. Yeah, so in this this project file is kind of like our package JSON. It lists our dependencies. So the moment I install this package, it's going to get listed here uh, with a, a specific version that it installed. Yeah, and um, Entity Framework is very similar to other ORMs in that it can it can talk to different databases. Um, you just have to set up the right driver to do that. So I ran that command. It is now here as a reference, and uh, we can start getting getting to coding. Um, so that's great. 
And this, I believe we need this, the, the Entity Framework core tools, because th this, this is a set of like uh, command line things I can run to generate migrations or generate a model, that kind of thing. Um, the command line interface, this is what I want. Actually, I can just run this command here. So this is going to give me um, like a, a globally installed thing that will let me run commands like migrate or uh, update database, that kind of thing. So we'll run this. Cool. So it was installed, and then now I can I can use it. Um, do I need the d design package? Let's see. I'm just going to search NuGet for this. Thank you, 2.8. So I do need it. Yeah, so they're saying it's, it's necessary for generating migrations. Um, I guess that makes sense. Like, if we're doing code first, then this dependency will um, help with that. So we're going to add another dependency. Yeah, I don't know if it, if it is like visual graphs. I think it's literally the, um, uh, yeah, like migrations and such. Okay, so we've got that. Um, now we go from here. So now, now that we have it installed, we can start setting up some models. Let's see. Yeah, so the, in, in this, I'm going to go through this tutorial. In this tutorial, they installed SQLite. In our case, we installed SQL Server. Um, we can create the model, define a context class and entity class. Um, great, 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 great. Um, I mean, it's not. It wasn't that much much work to install a dependency. We just ran a command, um, but we do we do need to get set up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a folder called uh, models, and then um, in here I'll create a model for uh, a recipe. Let's take a quick stretch. <laughs> Perfect timing. I need to learn C sharp Web API for an interview. It's not hard. There is a lot of like boilerplate here, but. Once we get it set up, we'll be flying. Okay, so basically I need a class that represents a recipe. Um, and then we can define what a recipe has. Um, we are gonna have uh, like an auto-incremented ID. Um, and I'm just gonna call it ID because that's what I prefer in my uh, database. Um, so each recipe has a unique ID. Um, we'll have a a string title. Um, so we have the title of the recipe. Uh, we also want, I guess, the just the content of the recipe. And then maybe we can have an image URL. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to add the we'll have to import the the other stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a good point from uh, Henry Kuck and um, in Odd Nation is saying uh, we should namespace it. Right. So if I put this here, I think we might be able to access it. Like, let me just try over here. Um, can I? No, it's not even in the namespace. Oh no, recipe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So technically, this code would compile, and I could create an instance of a recipe. But it is good practice to namespace your stuff. Basically, instead of just having this like globally available thing called a recipe, um, we can put it in a namespace. Um, let's call it uh, recipe app. And then we can do a nested namespace like models, um, and then put this in here. So. Now, anytime I want to use this, I'll need to uh, use that specific namespace, which will give me access to the recipe. Yeah. Uh, why create getters and setters? So these, these are automatic getter setters. Um, th this is like uh, a shorthand syntax for um, automatically creating like a... I 
I might be I might be a little bit wrong on this, but I think like basically behind the scenes there actually is like a private variable that holds the value, um, and this does all of that by default. Whereas if you wanted to do it manually, you'd have to create the uh, the private variable, and then you have a getter that sets that private variable, and a setter that oh sorry a getter that gets the private variable, and a setter that sets that fi private variable. This does all of that in a really shorthand, nice and easy way. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we have a recipe. Are there any other properties I need on a recipe? Yeah, so I I do know that the yeah, okay. I guess we'll do we'll do the convention. The convention in a in a C sharp class is to capitalize the name of your properties. But the reason I didn't want to do that is because it's now going to capitalize. Oh, well, I guess I could add some code. But whenever it generates the database table, it's going to create the column names with a capital letter. And I actually don't like that. I like my database field names to be a lowercase letter. I think there's actually an attribute we can add that will map it to a different column. Yeah, so that's what Jules is saying. We can, we can annotate it to map it to the lowercase column, but then that's just more work. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, we could add the author. So I think what we want, though, um, is we actually want to create another model, which is where we're going to be storing our users, because this is going to be a system that you can log into. Um, so if we create another model for a uh, user, um, and then a user has an ID and a username and a password. Um, so you'll log into the system, and then when you create a recipe, you will be the owner of that recipe. Um, so we can specify the creator is actually a, uh, a user, and then we also need um, the creator ID, which is what it'll, what it'll link it to. Like so. <laughs> uh, prep time, cook time. I think we're just going to handle all of that in the content field, and this will just be like markdown or something like that. It's not going to be anything special. We just needed something that we could uh, we could crud. All right. Um, so yeah, what we just set up there with the creator ID is very similar to this in that you have in the database itself, we're storing the ID of the thing that we're referencing, but the object relational part of it will actually automatically like join that or pull that that value in and then put it on this property here. Cool. Um, and then what else do I need here? I need to create a context. So uh, basically, I've defined my two um, database tables. I've defined my, my classes, and these two both map to a database table. Um, now I can create a context, which is like, the, the entry point for the database, and I can specify that this database has users, this database has recipes, um, and then we'll be able to create our migrations from there. Why is there a setter for the ID? Um, it's mainly for under the hood stuff, like the whenever we're pulling stuff in from the database, we need to be able to set that, not us, but the code that's actually pulling it in from the database. Yeah. Um, I think there's a way to, to add timestamps. We could probably do that uh, automatically. Uh, entity framework core timestamps. Mm. Yeah, so we have our created at, our updated at, and then the default is datetime.now. Uh, SQL Wordster is saying use the DB layer. Yeah, it's probably like we could probably have like a database trigger. I don't think we're going to have a database trigger. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Toasted Cheeses is saying override save changes async. So um, essentially, in the context that we create, we could have a method here that specifies the, well, it updates the created or the updated at field whenever something gets saved. We'll probably do that. We'll probably do that. Um, but let's add two columns of our date time uh, created at and updated at. Um, right now, it doesn't know what date time is, uh, but I can uh, 
use a keyboard shortcut uh, on a Mac, it's command period. And then that will give me some suggestions. And in this case, I need to use the system namespace because inside of the system namespace, they have a class defined date time. And that's the one that I want. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Toasted Jesus. We'll take a look at that in a bit. We, we still have to set up like the Docker container and the database and everything like that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. That makes that makes sense too, eight. We can actually talk about some, some C-sharp stuff, uh, but let's do that because uh, let's talk about why we would create a shared base class. So right now I have created at and updated at in the user model. Um, if I want this to also exist in the recipe, I would copy and paste it. I'd put it here. Um, this thing needs to use system just like the other one, and now we've got it. Works just fine, but this is where we can get into uh, like a shared fu shared functionality and inheritance. So because both of these models have this specific property, I can create a base model that they both inherit from. Let's do it. So if I create a model here called, uh, let's call it base model. Um, the thing, the only thing it has is created at and updated at, um, but in the future, if I come up with some other base functionality, we could put it there as well. So we're going to call this uh, base model. And a base model, I mean, technically, we could even include the, the ID column. If, if we were going to be really sure that every table in our database has an ID column, which it should, um, then we could put that in the base model as well. I say that and I laugh is because I'm, I'm working with a legacy system where uh, some of the database tables actually don't have a an ID column. Um, so that's a thing. But yeah, we'll put it here because we know both of, both of our models need it. So I have this, this base class. It has the base functionality. And then over here, I can now um, inherit from it. So or implement or implements inherits colon that. That's what I need. <laughs> yeah. So um, now that I've done this, essentially, uh, it's kind of like a tree. So base model is at the root of the tree. And then below that is recipe, but recipe inherits everything from base model. So because base model has ID created at and updated at, now recipe has that as well. Um, and we can do the same thing with the, uh, with the user model. Great. This is looking good. We're writing C-sharp code here. Um, and at this point, we do need a context. So uh, all, all of my, my C-sharp people in the chat, or in anybody that <laughs> writes code like this, where should I put this? Um, because it, it is, it's the DB context. It's not necessarily a model. I could have a folder for like context. I could have a folder, call it like services. Basically, I need a place to put this database context. Good evening, I heart coding. Um, core or miscellaneous. So create like a new folder. Make a data folder. Repository? Data? I like it. Let's call it data. Because then it can be in the namespace recipe app dot data dot uh, recipe database context. I like that. So let's create a file. Um, what did they call their context over here? The blogging context? Let's just call this the uh, recipes context. I like it. And then um, we'll need to bring in these two namespaces. Um, well, actually, yeah, we don't need systems collections generic. We just need entity framework core uh, because this database context is going to um, inherit from the base database context that, that exists inside of entity framework core, which will allow us to connect to our database. Um, so it's going to look like this. So we'll create a new namespace, uh, which is uh, recipe app dot data. And we'll have our class, which is the uh, recipes context. Um, is that what I called it? Yeah, recipe app dot models, recipe app dot data. Yeah, so uh, context is basically the way that we talk to the database. Um, it Internally, it's going to be the thing that connects to the database. It has a specific connection string. Um, and then it has the different database tables on it that we're going to be interacting with. So in this case, our database has a DB set of user. We'll call it users. Um, and it has a DB set of recipes. 
like this. Uh, now, because we specified our models in the recipe app.models namespace, over here, it doesn't know what they are because I actually have to use that namespace. So now that we're saying, hey, let's use that namespace, it knows what user and, and recipe are. So that's great. Um, the only thing here is we need to set up this database connection. Um, and in our case, it's going to be use SQL server. We're going to have to specify the connection string, but we're not quite there yet to do. Actually connect to database, because now we need a database to connect to. Um, and then, yeah, somebody mentioned this earlier, the um, public uh, on configuring. Oh, we're already here. Yeah. We'll need to change this. This is wrong right now, anyways. Um, but let's see if the thing actually compiles. So I'm just going to do uh, .NET build. I'm not actually going to run it. Just to see if we have any like syntax errors. Yeah, so it, the build worked. But if I tried to run it, it would attempt to connect to the SQL server like this, and that's not going to work. So now we need to actually get a, uh, a database going that we can connect to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my context class needs a few modifications if I want to use identity for... Uh, thank you, Henry. I'll, I'll have to look into that as well. We have quite a few steps. So basically, I need to get a Docker container going. Uh, before we generate migrations, I should look into authentication and make sure that my user class is set up to work with that, and then we can do the migration. Um, but uh, C Microsoft SQL Server is its own variant of SQL, SQL Server. It is not uh, based on MySQL. Um, though they both implement the SQL standard. Okay. Uh, MS SQL Docker container. I need to set this up. All right. Um, that's fine. I am going to create a Docker compose file just so I can specify any like environment variables or anything like that in it. Uh, so let's do it. In this folder of a new file, uh, docker compose.yaml. Is it docker dash compose? Nice. Um, and then we'll have a DB image that pulls from here. See if I can find an example of it. SQL versus SQL. It's just a preference. You can call it what you want. Um, can explain what Docker is for. It's for a, a lot, a lot of different things. <laughs> um, but uh, specifically, we're using it to spin up a, a, a Microsoft SQL Server database. So. Um, yeah, we're actually not going to run our .NET app in a container. We could, but I'm not going to. I'm mainly just doing this for the database. So uh, basically, I want a Microsoft SQL Server database. I could potentially attempt to install Microsoft SQL Server on this machine and get it configured, and then I could connect to it, but that's a lot of work. So basically what I can do here is I can say, um, I want to use this pre-configured image. This, this image is ready to go. I can basically just pull it down, start it up, and it's it's a database that I can like instantly connect to. Um, and we'll set up the, uh, the password here. So um, it should be fine. Um, I think one thing I do want to do, though, is set up a volume so that way any database, any data stored in the database gets persisted. Um, let's see if they do that in this in this walkthrough. Mm. Yeah, and there's probably like, like <laughs> there's probably no actual way to install a SQL server on a Mac. Um, Yeah, but uh, but what's what's interesting nice about this is this is just running on my machine when I spin it up, which is why it's okay to put make the password something that's not very secure, because um, this is just local. Eventually, I would provision a server in the cloud; it'd have a, a super secure password, and it wouldn't be exposed like this. Um, does anyone know why some containers don't need volume mapping but still persist data? They, there has to be a volume somewhere; otherwise, it's it's ephemeral. The moment you bring the image down. It, the data isn't anywhere. 
as far as I know, anyways. All right. Um, is fourteen thirty three the default uh, Microsoft SQL Server port? Can anyone confirm that? It's 1433, cool. So I'm also gonna map this here. Basically just say um, inside the container, it's listening on port 1433, but I want to expose that to my machine on port 1433, which is how our .NET process will connect to this database. Yeah, so I am gonna use, uh, this is something that we have to set up as well. So this is kind of like our environment variables. This is where I can set up like a database connection string and stuff like that. We're not quite there yet. I just wanna make sure I can get this database up and going. Um, Specify a volume on here. Thank you, P Pookie Pew. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted. Or is it volumes? Yeah, volumes. So uh, I'll do this. So basically, what this is saying is, in my local folder, I'll have a, a folder called DB Data, but in, in in inside of the container, anything that would go in here actually maps to that. So this this will persist the data. Um, and I'm just going to add a folder in here called DB Data, and that's where all the stuff will go. Okay, I think this is all we need. Um, let's try to start it. So I'll just do Docker Compose uh, up and see if we can get a Microsoft SQL Server going. Dub data. <laughs> cool, so it's gonna, it's gonna pull down that SQL Server image and um, it should start it up. Um, and actually, uh, I do wanna connect to that database, so I'm actually gonna get uh, Azure Data Studio. So this is just a, uh, like a, a desktop app that uh, lets you connect to the database and view the tables and stuff like that. Um, so we want it for a Mac. Yeah, we're, we're, we're using Entity Framework. Right now I'm just getting the database set up and then we'll connect Entity Framework to that database. There are VS Code extensions for database connections. Are, are they good though? <laughs> I, I've used Azure Data Studio. I don't, like Azure Data Studio is very similar to like SQL Server Management Studio. Um, Cool. So, um, yeah, DBVir is another one. It's fine. Is there a VS Code extension for it? What do I search for? SQL Server? Um, oh! Oh, yeah, I mean, this is basically what Azure Data Studio gives you. <laughs> um, should I just use this one? This one is official. It is from Microsoft. Oh, wait, actually, I already have it. What? Why do I already have it? Give me a second. Let me make sure there's nothing weird, <laughs> weird on here. Cool. Yeah. All right. Never mind. Scratch that. Don't worry about Azure Data Studio. Just install that SQL Server extension, uh, and then we can add a connection. Okay. Uh, the Docker is still spinning up. So it, it pulled the image, and now here we go. We'll see if it if it works. And then if it works, we can try connecting to it. It broke. Um, unable to set system administrator password. Password validation failed. The password does not meet SQL Server password policy requirements. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, we just need a more secure password. That's fine. This, this is our database password. 
Uh, here we go. Let's try spinning it back up. Uh, what's nice is uh, this time it, it doesn't have to, um, it won't have to pull down the image. We already have the image. Now it should just start it up. Does it need a symbol? We'll see. Nice. I think we're good. We're in. We're in. Okay, so we'll not, well, we're not in, but the database is up. So now I should be able to connect to that database. Oh, goodness. Um, I mean, localhost 1433. We'll do SQL login. Uh, the username is SA. And then the password is that thing we just generated. Save it. Did it connect? Um. Okay, unable to connect. Um, can I modify it? I probably shouldn't have specified 1433. Hello? <laughs> I'll just do localhost. How about that? SQL login. I think it I think it's SA. Let me confirm that. Cause the username, the default username I believe is SA, because it's saying like SA password. Alright, let's see. Save it. Hey, hey, it worked. All right, for some reason we have this thing here. Let's remove that old one. Okay, so if we look at it, there are no databases. We have ourselves a connection to that Microsoft SQL Server. Cool. Um, yeah, the, the issue I had the first time was I specified the port. I shouldn't have done that because it uses the default port. So this is great. We have a database. We can, we can connect to it this way. Now we need to write code that connects to the database. But we'll do that after the break. So I'm going to acknowledge all the alerts now. Yeah, so I have uh, alerts muted right now just so um, things aren't as distracting. But now I'm going to take the time to appreciate everyone. Uh, Ole Duke, thanks for that two-month resub. And Cola Flask for the four-months koozie with the 15 months. Thanks for the reminder. And anyone else watching, just know everything's going to be all right. Uh, and Pablo... Uh, you finally get the car you ordered eight months ago. Nice. Is it a, is it a Tesla? <laughs> right, thanks for the 10 months. Mike Broody with the nine months. Just started your first .NET job. Cool. I mean, we haven't really written much code yet, uh, but we've done, we've done a bit. And uh, Corey Graham, thanks for that gift, gift insights here with the 13 months. Much appreciated. Okay. So we've made some progress, and, and Corey Graham with, with more bits. Thank you for the bits. It's been a while, been busy, got an amazing new position. Got thrown in the deep end. Nice. Thanks for the support. Okay, uh, let's, let's recap what we've done so far. So we have set up and installed the .NET runtime. We generated a project. We talked about NuGet. Uh, we just got Docker set up. And we have like the, the initial pieces of Entity Framework Core, but we still need to connect it to the database. So uh, connect EF to DB with some connection string. But I don't want to just put the database connection string in my code. I want to have that managed by like a configuration file. So that's what we're going to set up next. Um, the other thing is someone mentioned earlier that this user class that I have uh, that I created may not be directly compatible with the authentication package that I'm going to be using. So I'm actually going to try to get this going first. Uh, where essentially I'll, I'll update my user class to make sure that it adheres to what this authentication package wants. So that way when we generate the database tables, everything it will, will work and stuff like that. Uh, but I am going to take a quick break because I've been streaming for an hour and a half. But when I come back, this is what we're going to do. We're going to set up authentication, uh, configure the app, and actually, Swagger is pretty much ready to go. And then we can just write the code to talk to the database, which is actually going to be very simple. Um, 
I say that it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty easy. But uh, stick around uh, while I'm gone. I think I'll put on a video. Um. What video should I put on? Do it the 30 minute silent break? I mean, I also could just put music on, but I'm using .NET 5, which is not .NET Core. I mean, it's technically .NET Core, but it's no longer called .NET Core. Um, what video should we do? I mean, for... <laughs> for for a juxtaposition, you can see me speed run a CRUD API with Node and Express. Uh, Hello, friends. Which I built in 20 minutes. But I mean, you'll see that like it's missing a lot of the stuff that our, our .NET API is going to have. Like this thing doesn't have swagger. Um, this thing doesn't have authentication. Um, but still, this, this is the one I'll leave you with. Uh, let me get the sound working just a second. Yeah, uh, uh, Biswa Viraj is asking, what is Swagger? Um, it's a way of documenting an API. Okay, uh, let me know if this sounds okay. Welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. This is going to be a 20 minute speed run. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna code as fast as I can to try and make a CRUD application. Create, read, update, delete. We also just got into a hype train. People are hyping. I don't know, but we gotta go. So let's, let's just, let's just jump right into it. Uh, break is gonna be about 20 minutes. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. I will see you all very soon. Uh, take a walk. Um, or call somebody you love or drink some water. I'll be back soon. Wait. Yeah, okay, here we go. Right into it. Am I going to be able Hello friends, welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. This is going to be a 20 minute speed run. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna code as fast as I can to try and make a CRUD application. Create, read, update, delete. We also just got into a hype train. People are hyping. I don't know, but we gotta go. So let's, let's just, let's just jump right into it. Am I gonna be able to do it? I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm gonna try my best. I'm gonna try my best, but here we go. So, uh, I'm gonna make a, a server folder. And actually, for the sake of time, I'm going to use a, uh, a generator. So npx uh, create express API. Uh, we'll call it server. Thank you very much, the she boss, for the gifted sub. <laughs> so th this is a generator that I created, which will generate a base express app, give us all of the things we need, like express. Um, it might it might add cores. It'll add a logger. It adds all of our middlewares. Basically, we're we're set up and ready to go so that we can focus on the the crud aspect of it. Um, so, thank you very much, Bozivius, for the bits. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I've used Yarn before, but I, I prefer NPM. Okay, so that generates this app for us. Uh, if you take a look at the README, it tells you all the things that we get. We get Morgan for logging, Helmet, Dottie, and V. But basically, we have a base app, basically. <laughs> but from here, we need to build it out. Um, so... So many things are- I, I appreciate you all for the bits. I'm gonna acknowledge all of the bits after- after the- after the train is over. <laughs> so we have a basic express app, we have all of our middleware set up, we're gonna focus on just creating the CRUD routes. Um, and so here in the API folder, I'm gonna create, um, a new file, and I'm gonna call it, um, FAQ. So we're going to create, read, update, and delete frequently asked questions. So, 
here we go. Two minutes in, this is the actual code. So we need to bring in express. Um, and then we're gonna create a router. Uh, express.router. So a router is the thing that's going to have all of our routes. And then we're gonna export it. So uh, module.exports that router. Um, and we're gonna need several different routes. So we're gonna have uh, the, first we're gonna do the get. So let's say router.get um, slash. So when we request, request slash FAQs, that'll give us all of the frequently asked questions. Um, so we're gonna have to fill, fig, fill that in. Rec resin next. Uh, 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 we'll do it. Okay, <laughs> so this is the uh, read all. Um, we also need the read one. So you can get one specific frequently asked question by ID. Um, we'll be able to create one. So that's going to be a post request to just slash. So that will be uh, create one. Um, we'll be able to update. I guess that will be um, a put to some ID. We'll update that one. And then we will, we will be able to delete one as well. So that's going to be a delete request. Delete. To some given ID. Cool. Um, for now, we're just going to res.json a message. Hi. <laughs> Hello, read all. Hello, read one. Uh, hello, create one. Hello, update one. <laughs> and then hello, delete one. <laughs> yeah, done, ship it. Okay, so that's, that should give us our routes. Uh, now we need to actually mount this router. So uh, the way I have this set up is we have this API router. Uh, which mounts other routers inside the API folder. So I can bring in uh, FAQs. And we're talking about frequently asked questions. I'm actually going to rename this with a S. Plur I'm going to plur plur pluralize it. FAQs, great. Okay, we got that. Um, so we brought it in. Now we need to mount it. And so uh, I'm going to say router.use slash FAQs with that router. So all of the routes inside of that router that we just set up will be prepended with slash FAQs. Uh, this API router is in turn mounted at the root at slash API v1. So API v1 FAQs will, uh, should serve that up. So uh, let's go ahead and try to run it. NPM run dev. Ah! Oh yeah, <laughs> we can't use port 5000 because something's already using port 5000. Um, so let's do this. We're gonna create a, a .env. Um, and we're going to set our port, ah, test fail, <laughs> set our port to 9999, uh, oh, not, not 999, all right, try again, address in use, what, I guess I have so many services running on my computer, uh, 4242, there's nothing running on port 4242, there we go, <laughs> so, um, and let me just put that up there so you can see it. If we go to port, if we go here, we have our basic API. If we go to uh, slash API slash V1, we should see the API route. If we go V1 slash FAQs, this will say, hello, read all. Uh, I'm gonna use a tool called Insomnia to test all of the other routes for like post requests and patch requests and stuff like that. Um, so let me open up Insomnia. Tesk failed successfully. <laughs> successfully. <laughs> um, all right, just a second. Um, new folder, uh, crud FAQs. Am I gonna be able to do it? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so this is a, t oh no, the timer reset. Uh, we were, we have basically, 13 minutes left. How many seconds are in 13 minutes? Tell me, hurry, hurry. <laughs> um, thank you all for the hype train, very much appreciated. I'm wasting time. We actually, like, how many seconds, what's oh, 12 times 60? Six times two is 120, uh, 780, okay. 
<laughs> We're gonna go with 730 then. There we go. Good enough. Okay, so this is a tool called Insomnia, uh, and it allows me to make requests to my my access point or to my uh, endpoints. So I can do this. That gives, should give me read all. Um, if we do a git slash some id like id five, that should read one. Great work. Uh, if I do a post request to slash frequently asked questions, that will attempt to create a frequently asked question. Uh, if I do a, um, a put to frequently asked question slash five, that will update the item with ID five. And if I do a delete, that should delete the item with ID five. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna install a, a few other things to get the rest of this going. Um, we're gonna install a tool or a, a library called Monk. It's really easy to crud MongoDB using this library called Monk. Um, you could use Mongoose. Monk is good, I like it. And we're also going to use uh, Joy. Um, which is a schema validation library. So we'll use that to validate incoming data to make sure it has the right format. Um, I think they renamed themselves, or they're under the happy namespace, at happy slash joy. Yeah, I can never get Monk to work. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my best to get it to work. So Monk lets us talk to MongoDB Happy, uh, happy joy, happy, happy joy, joy <laughs> is a is a, a schema validation library. Uh, oh, and we got some we got some security vulnerabilities. Let's fix those. Ten minutes left. Can we do it? The thing is, like, it's an API. Will we be able to create a front end? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> We're gonna try our best. Um, so uh, I'm gonna need another variable here that's like uh, Mongo URI. Um, and right now I can just do localhost slash um, FAQs. So that's going to connect to MongoDB that's running on my computer to a database called FAQs. Um, all right. Um, this is a speed run. I feel like I'm slowing down, but let's, let's bring in Monk. <laughs> so we're going to bring in Monk. Um, and then we can connect to the database. So the way you connect to a database is you just say monk and then you pass in the connection string. So I'm going to say process.env.mongouri and that should connect to the database. Um, and then to get access to a specific collection, so let's call this the FAQs, you just say db.get and then you spec specify the name of the collection. Um, so if I've done that correctly, really all we need to do is, is query that database. So um, I'm going to do a try catch. So we'll attempt to say all of the uh, items are FAQs.find. And this is a, a function that returns a promise. So search my database for all of the FAQs. And then once you get those back, we're going to respond with them. Uh, but if there was an error, we're just going to forward it. So if it couldn't connect to the database or something like that, we're going to see that error. So now if we make a request to get all FAQs, we should see an empty array. And we do. Look at that. We're connected to the database. We have an empty array. So uh, actually, that's all we need to do for get all. Um, let's go ahead and set up create one. So um, we're going to need a try catch. Um, we need to validate the body. So I'll say, um, yeah, 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 it's working. It's great. <laughs> so let's create a schema. We're going to go ahead and bring in joy. Um, We'll bring that in from at happy joy. I need to go look at their docs to figure out how do I create a schema. Um, schema equals joy dot uh, op object. We'll figure it out. <laughs> but basically, we're going to specify what goes into a frequently asked question. Um, so let's look at their documentation and API. Um, We'll look at examples, I guess. Joy.object. Yeah, and then you pass in all the properties you want. Great. So uh, what will our frequently asked questions have? They will have a question, which is um, joy.string.trim.required. So a frequently asked question must have a question. A frequently asked question must have an answer. Um, and what else? Uh, potentially, we're not going, and, and it's required, not require, required. And um, we probably won't have this for all of them, but maybe we'll have like a video URL. So potentially, um, if there is a video associated with 
um, this frequently asked question, then we'll put that in. Uh, what else? What else do I need? I think that's it. Questions, answers, video URL. Um, we'll probably do like created app, um, but we'll just automatically add those. We don't really need that in our schema. And this is good enough. It's it's super easy. That's all we want. Okay, so we have this schema. This is now going to allow us to validate uh, the incoming uh, incoming data that we send to our server. So to, the way you do it is schema dot validate, and that gives you back the validate. Uh, the valid the valid thing oh yeah, yeah yeah it does have url you're right um or uri is actually what it's called um uh, good enough <laughs> so we expect it to be a uri um we could limit it to like http it doesn't matter i'm gonna be the only one using this anyways um okay post so first we want to validate the request body um so we'll do schema.validate. The data that we're going to pass in is rec.body. So rec.body is the thing that we're actually sending to the server. Let me just log it out to make sure that we're getting it. Um, and if it's uh, if it's valid, we're just going to respond with that valid body. Res.json with, uh, with that value. Uh, if there was an error, we're going to forward that to our error handler. And then we need to make this an async. Yeah, we got six minutes. I think I, I, it, this is going to be just the API. There's no way, no way I could build a front end for this um, in that amount of time. But okay, we should be able to create new or at least send post requests to create a new one. So we'll do a post. The body is going to be JSON. Uh, right now, I'm just going to send an empty body and we should get back an error. Yeah, question is required. So if I say question is how you do that and then we do that we should get back answer is required great i just do <laughs> and then we also want a video url uh, and if we specify that as something that's not a valid url it should complain uh, video url must be a valid uri great so um and also we could just leave it off because it's not required and then that awesome so uh, we're not putting it in the database yet we're actually just, uh, this validator, if it if it throws an error, that goes into our catch. But if it doesn't throw an error, it gives us back the validated item. Um, and I think that should be fine. Let, what happens if I put an extra property? Whoa. Wat is not allowed. Yeah, so by default, it prevents extra properties from being added on there as well. Okay, so I think we're good to go. At this point, we just need to insert it. So um, I'll say inserted is uh, await uh, FAQs dot insert. I think that's it. <laughs> that's all I got to do. <laughs> Res.json uh, inserted. Um, and so now if I try to put something in the database, we should get back. There it is. And it's got an actual ID. So that's awesome. Um, so now it's in my database. Um, we could do some some validation, like let make sure that this question already isn't in the database, but that's fine. Um, let's go ahead and do uh, get one. So now I should be able to request a specific one by ID. So simple try catch, forward the error. Um, we're going to grab the ID from the uh, params. So rec.params. And this is basically uh, the parameter in the URL. And then we'll say, uh, item equals await. Oh, it, it does need off, I know, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> FAQs dot uh, find one, I believe is a method we can use. Um, and we can specify our, our query. So where uh, ID underscore ID. So in the database, it's called underscore ID because it's Mongo is equal to the ID that was passed in. Um, if the item was found, then we're just going to return it. Uh, actually, we'll we'll do an early return or an early early throw. So we'll say if there was no item, then we're going to return. Um, we're actually just going to call next. So that should forward onto our um, that should forward onto our not found handler. Um, not return. I want this. I need this to be an async method. <laughs> yeah, we're using Express. Um, all right. So. Uh, find one by that ID. If we didn't find it, call next, which should go to our not found handler. But if we did find it, respond with it. Okay. So if I do a get request to FAQs slash uh, that specific ID, we get it back. Great. But if I do it to something that's not found, 
uh, argument passed in must be a single string of 12 bytes or a string of 24 X characters. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a, that's an okay error messages. I'm not opposed to that. Uh, what if we did this, but we just change a value? Yeah, then it forwards it to not found. Good enough. Good enough. Okay, so we've got get all. We've got get one. We can create one. Now let's update one. Um, two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got this. <laughs> so update will be similar to create. We're just going to do a full on replacement of that item. So um, if you're updating, we need to validate the request body. Um, and actually, I'm going to. Yeah, we shouldn't have the ID there, but we're going to grab the ID from um, rec.params again. And then instead of inserting, we need to grab the existing one to make sure that it exists. So basically, we do a similar thing to whenever we were reading one. So um, validate the body. Find one with that ID. If we didn't find it, error. After, and if we found it, we know that that ID actually exists. And now we need to update it. So we'll say updated is going to be um, faqs.update. And we want to update. Uh, where the ID is equal to that given ID. And we're going to pass in the, the validated schema here. Cool. So uh, that should do it. Um, if we request all FAQs, we have that one. We have this ID. Let's say I want to do a, a put to FAQ slash that ID. And we're going to change this to an exclamation mark. Send it. The update operation document must contain atomic operators. Ah, I totally forgot. <laughs> so uh, we actually, what we actually want to do is we want to say uh, dollar sign set should be um, the values that were passed in, and that's going to set each of the properties. Thirty seconds. Ah, okay. So <laughs> it modified it. Um, that's fine. I think instead of returning the updated, we'll return the value. Eighteen seconds. That's fine. Um, and then. We just got to do this 11 seconds. I got it. So <laughs> when we're deleting by ID, we grab the ID from the params, rec.params. Uh, we'll say uh, await uh, FAQs dot delete, or is it remove? I forget. We're out of time, but it should be easy. Delete where ID is that given ID, um, and then we'll respond. <laughs> um, or I think we'll just send a, a 200 status code. I mean, I kind of want to respond with an object. I, I know that like there's a, a rest specification that says um, you know, whenever you delete, you actually should just respond with the status code and not an actual body, but I don't know. All right, we're out of time. This should work. Okay, so uh, I'll test updating one again. So this should should work when we try to update we're going to put and then uh it updated it and if we do a get for that specific one we see the updated one that's great and then if we do a delete for that specific id facts.delete is not a question uh, not a function i think it's just remove then so remove all right this is it this is it we've got it success all right and now if we do a request for that one we should get 404 not found because it's not in the database anymore and if we do a request for all of them we should get an empty array that's it we did it we created a uh, a crud api in about 20 minutes um maybe i'll do another challenge video where we build a crud front end in about 20 minutes that could be fun but we're done thank you everyone for watching um th this is not tdd no 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 we, we implemented it with uh error error first development <laughs> We did it! Everyone say bye, YouTube. Bye, YouTube! Wow! Wow! Okay. Um... Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Hello. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I ate a sandwich. Yeah. Got some lunch. <laughs> cool. So uh, any if, for those of you that watched that video and didn't know what a CRUD API was before that, now you know what a CRUD API is. Basically, we're going to be building a very similar thing, but with, uh, with C Sharp. Uh, and where we left off was uh, getting our auth and configuration set up. Yeah, that was a pre-recorded stream. <laughs> Just one sandwich. Yeah, I only had enough time to eat one. 
Uh, if you do exclamation mark FAQs, I have all the information you need about uh, what Mac I'm using and how it's set up and stuff like that. Uh, what happened with .NET and Entity Framework? Oh, uh, I was on a break. <laughs> Apparently not everyone knew it was a video. <clears throat> yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay. Uh, let us research authentication uh, to see what this requires because we need to make sure that our user class adheres to whatever this thing needs. <clears throat> authentication is the process of determining a user's identity. Great. Uh, authentication schemes are specified by registering authentication services and startup.configure services. So earlier we saw this. Um, this is where it's setting up Swagger and all that other stuff. We can also set up authentication here. So that's what we need. Um, And we are going to use be using JSON web tokens. So it's going to be something like this. Um, add authentication, bare defaults authentication scheme. Um, and do I need a package for this? Where is it coming from? This is what I want. So uh, add authentication, JWT bearer. Something like this. Um, thank you, Brooklyn Dev. Microsoft at ASP.NET Core authentication. I'm curious why it didn't didn't suggest that for us, but <clears throat> we can do it. So uh, basically, right now it doesn't know about this method. But if I import this namespace, that's the thing that will um, add that method to the authentication thingy. So we'll just do import, or no, not import, using <laughs> uh, Microsoft .ASP.NET Core dot authentication maybe dot oauth I really don't know we'll have to, we'll have to look this up <clears throat> do 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 code omitted for brevity well, friends, um, let's just look it up. .NET Core add JWT bearer. This is in JWT bearer extensions. Oh, I need to install it. Well, they didn't tell me that. <clears throat> Let's look it up on NuGet. Um, authentication? They might have told me that. I might have just scrolled past it. Uh, here we go. ASP.NET, authentication core, and authentication bear. I think I need both of these. Yeah, I think I need both of these. So I'm, just, I'm actually just going to install... Yeah, this one and hope that it brings in the other two. Um, so dot net package install install the JWT. Okay, I'll install. Thank you. <laughs> Let's install the JWT one. Um, what's the command? Dot net add package. That's it. Add package that. And so that will install it just like we did with Entity Framework earlier. You may be able to help. Uh, I think that's that's all we needed, though. And now, now it just doesn't complain. So now that I have that package installed, this thing, this thing exists. Uh, so we can use it. Um, 
And so these are the options for our, our JSON web token. The fact that it is um, the audience, like we technically should be pulling this from like a configuration and that way when we're in, in production, we can set these to be something different. Let's see if there's anything else I need to add though. Um, selecting the scheme with the authorized attribute. Um, yeah, so this is basically, we don't even have a controller yet, but when I do have a controller, this is what I'll want to do to say that any route that gets hit in here should uh, use that specific uh, authentication scheme. <clears throat> Introduction to identity. Uh, yeah, it's similar to middlewares. Um, similar in that it's going to like read the 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 header, parse the token, specify the user, that kind of thing. Um, I actually think we are going to just specify our own auth controller that like creates the users and such. I just need to make sure that um, um, everything else is set up right. Because we have, yeah, we have use authorization. And then do we have to use authentication? Hmm. Log in, log out. Authorize. It's really all. I, let, let's just test it. So now that I have uh, this in place, um, I, th I do think I need some sort of authorizer middleware. But on that controller that it got generated with the uh, the weather forecast controller, if I now put this here, um, it should require that we are authorized to access this route. Let's see what happens. Start it back up. Okay, yeah, I th there definitely are some more steps. Basically, we need to specify that it should um, parse the token and 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 validate it. All that good stuff. JVT auth is the default. Let's see what happens though. Like if I try to make a request here, do I get an unauthorized? Yeah, here, well, I don't get an unauthorized, but I do get an error. No authentication scheme was specified and there was no default challenge scheme found um, using either add authentication with the default scheme. That's what we need. So right here we can do um, that JW thing, T thing. Default challenge. Yeah, thank you, Brooklyn. Yeah, so we have right now we have use authorization, use authentication, but we need to specify the default, uh, which looks like this. Thanks, thanks to Brooklyn Dev. Something like this. Do you have a, a Brooklyn Dev? Do you have a link that you found that from? You can share it in the chat. And then let's see. Yeah, then we can use this. So we're using the JWT bearer uh, namespace, which now lets us set the default theme. All right, here we go. Let's try again. Uh, the metadata address or authority must use HTTPS unless disabled for development. Uh, what's the duplicate? I know that um, th this is this is different. This is use and this is add. <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I should probably just find like a, a better tutorial that walks us through it. Oh yeah, no worries, Brooklyn Dev. I'll find it. I should find it instead of just pasting stuff in from chat. Um, all right. Oh, actually, no, no, authorization. Let's look at authorization. Create a web app with authorization. Put the use HTTPS redirect inside the else on is development. So we shouldn't use HTTPS redirection? I mean, that'll make things easier on us. Let's see. Did it restart? I don't trust it. <laughs> Thanks for these articles. Is can anyone find something on the like the Microsoft site though? All right, I'll look at those in a second. Let's just see what this did. <clears throat> Can I now just go to HTTP instead of HTTPS? No. I'm going to keep it as HTTPS. Um... The authority? Let's see if that changes it. Yeah, this is the one that I followed. Um, we need, so there, there needs to be a place that I like specify the, uh, like the JSON web token, or the JSON token secret, that kind of thing. Yeah, I guess I could do this where instead of just authorize, right, right now I just have authorize. Here I could say use yeah, this authentication scheme. Token validation parameters. That's probably what I want. So that's going to be over here, right? Yeah. Okay. So token validation parameters is of type token validation parameters. And that is coming from identity model tokens. And then that requires some options. <laughs> And then options, well, I, I mean, uh, Toasted Cheese has helped. They've, I'm going to try to figure out the code without uh, without copy pasting, but it's basically this. Um, and then uh, what can I specify on my options? Let's see what this provides. Save token, challenge, audience, authority, What's up, uh, C Sharp Fritz? Uh, if you really want to know how to write C Sharp.net, definitely follow C Sharp Fritz. Um, we are in the middle of figuring out authentication. We're trying to set up JSON web tokens with a uh, .NET Core API. Um, I'm just going to look this up online. I mean, we can see in those articles that were linked if they specified this. Yeah, something like this. Cool. Mm, where do they specify the token, though? Uh, 
Default token providers. Okay. I believe instead of this, they do this. Um, there's that. I'm also seeing this, which should fix that other error we were seeing. Um, so this is fine. I think for now, um, we'll hard code this because the next step is to bring in some configuration. Something like that. All right. Compiled successfully. Now we can try it. Issuer signing key? Nice. That's what I wanted to see. So right now, because on our controller, uh, we have this authorize. And I think now that we have the default set, I should just be able to do that. So authorize, let's recompile. And then there we go. OK, it's great. Uh, now I want to specify the, the signing key, which um, might be issuer signing key. Oh, yeah, 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 because it's a symmetric key. Perfect. Perfect. And so we can do that over here as well. Yeah, so uh, people are asking about this syntax. It's actually, it's actually pretty nifty. So basically what this is doing is it's creating an instance of token validation parameters. And then inside of the curly braces, you can specify the value of some of the properties for that, that, in, for that instance. Uh, it's a nice little shorthand. Um, the, the other way to do it is uh, you create an instance and then you specify each property manually. So the other way to do it would be um, like token validation equals a new one of those. And then afterwards you could say uh, token validation dot validate issuer equals thing, etc. So you'd specify all the properties manually. So this is a nice little shorthand. Um, there's that. And then for now, our secret is uh, keyboard cat. Great. Yeah. OK, so we got that set up. <laughs> um, this, should be, this should be fine. So, so now this is basically uh, looking at the header of every incoming request and checking to see if it has a token. And then if it has a token, um, it's it's validating it against um, this. Making It's like it's validating that it was signed with the right key and that it has the right issue or, and stuff like that. So now uh, we need to generate some tokens. Um, and there's a way to, I mean, I also need like an, a login endpoint, um, potentially a create user endpoint which we'll in turn get the, the token from. Um, but what I want to do first is I want to get the uh, token integrated with the Swagger documentation. Because right now, if we look at our, if we look at our Swagger docs, uh, there's nowhere for us to specify an authorization header. And I know there's something I can add, which will basically uh, give me a way of setting what the token is so that it can val validate it. I have a serious security problem. Tell me about it. We are not close to the end. We're setting up auth. Um, let me just close these extra tabs, and we'll figure out Swagger. Swagger. .NET Core. Use validate issuer signing key.
Oh, that's not set by default? This should absolutely be a default, right? <laughs> There's no way that's not a default. Um, oh, we can actually, we can test it later. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it off for now. And we'll test it once I get some tokens that we can pass into this thing. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so basically in my Swagger UI, I want something like this so I can specify a token. Um, after some f research, I eventually found the answer here. Mm-hmm. We just add a security definition. All right, I am gonna take a chance. <laughs> I'm gonna go with the top answer. I feel like uh, there's like there's like there should be some Microsoft documentation on this that I can follow. Let's see. It's written by Mr. Fritz himself, but it was this is from 2017, um, so maybe a little bit outdated. Do we have swagger here? Oh no, there's no swagger. Um. <laughs> yeah, that Jeffrey guy is awesome. <laughs> uh, those are traffic lights. All right. This article was last updated in 2021. Do you think I can trust it? Is this the one that someone linked me to earlier? Yeah, there, my green screen is here. I'll just do this because I'm not reaching that far over. Check it. Shoop. Okay. Um, this is fine. Does this have swagger? Here we go. This. This is the piece I wanted. Yeah, and I'm I am not I am not a robot. Okay. Uh this is inside of Ad Swagger Gin. Should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh I mean, honestly, this 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 is development, is searching the docs. Especially because I I mean, you you often see me writing Node and JavaScript stuff, which I have done a lot of, so I'm very familiar with it. Um Whereas this, I don't do as much in terms of like the setup. Because right now I'm working on a, a .NET project at work and it's already all set up. I'm just working within the context of that project, not setting everything up. Okay, add swagger gin. Where is that happening? Right here. So this is where this code needs to go. Um, yeah, let's call that swagger. It's fine, it's already doing that. Okay, so we're saying we have uh, a bare authentication scheme. It's like an API key. It's in the header. Beautiful. All right, security requirement. Seems fine, I like all of this. Wow. I just tried to format it because this is like double spaced instead of single spaced. Okay. This also says um, we add the authentication. I think we've already done this. Specified the default authentication scheme. Um, yeah, we did that here. And then um, there's all of that. 
should be fine. Uh, but now that we have that, it compiled and our Swagger UI now has this nice little authorized thing. Nice. Um, so I can make a request, it fails, but if I specify a token, so if I do, well, let's make it fail. Let's see what happens if I specify a bad token. Same unauthorized. Um, does JWT.io, can it generate tokens? Because basically what I can do just to test that all of this is working is I can generate a token using this key. And if it accepts my token, then uh, we're good to go. JWT generator. I'll probably be streaming for like at least another hour because we still need to uh, migrate the database, create the API endpoints, all that good stuff. Um, issuer. Five thousand one. Uh, username CJ. This should be fine. And then the key is keyboard. Cat. So this gives us a token. And then if we specify that token here, does it work? No, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, this is saying the signature is invalid. That's a good, that's a good thing to get. Um, did we use a different algorithm? Did we specify the right key um you can have a key that short like i mean so that's why i use keyboard cat is because the um the default in a lot of express out express apps is keyboard cat um Should be fine. Oh no, it, it doesn't set bearer. You do have to do bearer and then the, the thing itself. The signature is invalid. Is it because we don't have... Um, this? Compile, refresh. Hmm. Hmm. And what's up, dude? Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for being here. We also need audience. Yeah, so that's what Julian is saying. Um, though I, I feel like we would get a different error, though, rather than signature is invalid. Okay. Let's try it with this one. Mm -mm. Well, can we make it next month? I also feel like we should get an error that says uh, the token is expired rather than invalid signature. All right, <clears throat> I can try with a longer key. <laughs> Someone was saying that this needs to be a certain number of um, <clears throat> certain number of characters. Am I using the wrong algorithm? Should I be using five twelve? Like I, 
I am like 90% sure I actually have to put the word bearer right here. We can try it without. Yeah, still unauthorized. Um, and this time it's not even saying invalid signature, so it couldn't detect the token that way. Okay. Let's find a different token generator. <laughs> uh, try without validations on. Oh, you mean like in the configuration? I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Like, don't validate the issuer. Don't validate the audience. Do validate the signing key. I mean, usually, like, the token setup in Express is sometimes this simple, where, like, you're not validating these things. You're just really validating the signing key. That validating that this token was signed with a specific key. Um... I'll try this one more time. No issuer. Expires next month. People are just pasting tokens. <laughs> Let me try this one. No, it's still saying invalid signature. Does symmetric security key take the key in the constructor? That's what we're doing here. It takes a byte array. Is this an exa Is this a symmetric or is this asymmetric? Yeah, that's basically what we're doing here. We're encoding this as a byte array. Passing it in here. Let's not validate the signing key. <laughs> this is, you shouldn't do this in production, but let's just see if this at least gets us through. No. It still says the signature is invalid. Um... Let's just not have authentication. <laughs> we'll figure it out. I'm sure I'm sure I'm doing something doing something silly. Have I tried validating the signature? I mean Yeah, let's try this one. Thank you, 28. Really long keyboard cat. Um the secret was base64 URL encoded and needed decoding before it could be used in the signing key. Oh. So that's why someone is saying uh, base64 URL encoder. Decode bytes. I'm not opposed to it. Because that, that underscore could be throwing us off. All right. Um. Still invalid signature. Look at this. Hello, uh, uh, Illum FX. Yeah, B bearer definitely needs to do there. Be there. Like I, I do this at uh, at work, and we we already validated that if bearer is not there, then we don't even get the invalid signature error. All right, we got some Stack Overflow. Uh, I changed the signature back to Keyboard Cat though. It's, 
keyboard cat. Oh, this isn't very helpful, but it is <laughs> it is the actual um, definition of it all. Okay. Try a really long key. Okay, let, let me try it. Um, this one, really long keyboard cat, please work. Okay, this is a different error. Unable to code, decode system.string as base64 for URL encoded string. So uh, let's go back to what we had before. Um, this. Is it that my key was too short? That'd be really unfortunate if it was. Oh, you, you know what? Like we we could we could actually do a um, live debugging, but there's not many breakpoints we could set. Um, yeah, ASCII dot get bytes. Let's see if the longer the longer key worked though. It's running great. We'll generate it with. This that was not the issue. Okay. <laughs> um, Git bytes should handle it. I mean, maybe I can't trust this 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 token generator. Maybe we just need to generate a token. Here's what I'll do. I'll just create a um, a separate endpoint that generates a token using that exact same secret. Um, so let's do this. We'll have uh, the auth controller. Don't need any of that. The auth controller will not take in any authorization, and we will call it the auth controller. Uh, and the git route um, will just return a, a token string. OK. Now, how do I generate a token? <laughs> Um, I'm just going to search for it. Generating a JSON web token. Okay. This. Is this really what I need? Let's see. Um, so this should use, we're gonna go back to keyboard cat. This should create the token using the same one that we're verifying it with. So over here, it's gonna be keyboard cat. Is this gonna be a 12 hour stream? No, we'll fix this within the next five minutes. Um, use that let's use that all right so we're using uh, HMAC 256 um, the issuer the same thing we had before the vid validity is add uh, this tokens valid for 10 minutes and then we create a token that has all that info.
the formatting of this code I copy and pasted is really off. Great. Uh, where is this coming from? That makes sense. Great. This is it. So now we sh if it compiles, it does not compile. Um, yeah, yeah, this, this is um, the time the token expires. So it should, it'll expire in 10 minutes, which is fine. That's enough time to test it. Cool. But now we have this auth endpoint, um, which should just give us back a token. And it doesn't. Um, the encryption algorithm requires a key size of at least 32 bits. <laughs> that, I mean, that's what people were mentioning. Really big keyboard cat. I need a longer string? That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Oh boy. I mean, here's the thing. I, okay, regardless. Let's just see if, the, if this, so now we have a token. Let's see if it works. It, of course, longer is secure, but I'm in development right now. I'm just trying to test it out. No, it still says unauthorized. So. Oh, oh, well, we, we have a, we have a, we have to put put the same token. So that token goes there, and then um, here we need the same one. All right, let's get a token. This is basically like logging in without a username and password. We're just instantly getting a token back. Um, but we're gonna fix that after we test that the, that the validation is actually working. Jeez, it works. Whew. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what I want to complain about because basically, I mean, we did try it with a bigger key, but I think also for whatever reason, the token generator that we were using, yeah, that's the thing. I don't even know what the issue was. I think the issue potentially was this thing was generating tokens in the wrong way. Um, regardless. Great. <laughs> um, at this point, we are going to need endpoints for like actually passing in a username and password and validating it against the database and, and all that good stuff. Um, but I think we're at, a, we're at a good point to now set up configuration. So yeah, thank you all for the claps. We, we, we did it. <laughs> um, it's great. But actually, I'm, I am curious though, like what is inside of this token that I just generated? I mean, it's pretty simple. We have issuer, audience, and expiration. Cool. Uh, all right, we're doing it. But I have some hard-coded stuff, right? I've got the signing key as a string. We don't want that. I've got the issuer hard-coded. We don't want that. Um, what else? Um... There's some other hard-coded stuff. Eventually, when we connect to the database, we don't want to hard-code that string. So what I need is configuration. Um, and there is some stuff built in that helps us with that. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, and when it generated, did we get... Yeah, yeah, so it did. So app settings dot json it actually generated this for us so this is just a json file where we can um, specify all of our stuff and then we do have a way of reading it in our app um, let's see how they're reading it in configuration yeah and so basically what we can do is we can specify uh, a strongly typed config that when we create it, we pull in all the data from this JSON file, so that way we can use it elsewhere. Um, like I could have a section here called like uh, JWT, and then we'll have something like the token is 
um, this. It's in the services configure section. Okay, I'll check it out. Um, and then also we can specify the issuer and the audience um, and the um, expiration, which will be, let's say this token lasts for uh, one hours, expiration hours. Cool. Um, am I a professional full stack developer? Technically, <laughs> I get I get paid to make full stack apps. So yeah, technically I am. Um, great. This is our JSON Web Token configuration. Uh, let's let's make a strongly typed class that pulls it all in. Um, I'm curious if they have that anywhere already for us. Um, this configuration here, um, yeah, it's built in. How can I get it to parse differently? Services.configure, configuration.get section JWT. Mm. Okay, yeah, and then if we look in program, create default builder. So, I mean, uh, would I like create an instance of the configuration here? I guess that's probably, that's probably what I need. Um, you all can tell me if this is a bad idea or if there's a better way to do it. But basically, I want to create a, um, a class that has some properties on it, like JSON Web Token Secret and JSON Web Token Issuer. Um, and then um, I'll make all of these properties static. And then when the app starts up, I'll create... Um, I'll, spe I'll set all of the properties on that static class, and then I can use it elsewhere. How does that sound? Or is it configure? Oh, I see. Can I, sp I can, I can pass in the type of the thing here and it'll automatically parse it. Yeah. So, I mean, my thought is we create a singleton with static properties and then we just use that everywhere. But is there a built-in way to do it? Yeah. So I, I know that they have this. They have this, um, but can I pass in like recipe app config like this and I'll create this class recipe app config? So yeah, sure, this, this can get a section. Um, yeah. I'm just going to start coding, and you can all tell me if I'm crazy. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a file. Uh, actually, I'm just going to call it... Can I call it config.js? I, I know uh, for that specific section. I know that's totally... Like, I could do that. I could, I could say get section, and then I could specify the properties that I want, but I want to statically type it. Um, so that gives me a builder. 
check it. Check, check, check what I do. Check what I'm gonna do. <laughs> um, actually, let's just call it like app config. Did I call it dot js? Ah, no, dot cs. Here we go. Uh, so we have a class uh, app config. Cool. Um, and then this thing has a, a constructor that takes in an I configuration. Um, <laughs> like this. But our app config can have properties like um, uh, JWT options. like this, and then JWT options could be a class. This needs to be public. And JWT options has a public string issuer like this, and an audience, and a token. Like this, okay? So we have now created a, a class that represents the stuff in here. Um, and I guess we also need like expiration. Right? 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 Okay. And now when we create an instance of this thing, um, uh, it will pull in the configuration and then like parse it and manually pull out this thing. Right? Am I crazy here? <laughs> That's what's built in out. Okay, if it's built in out of the box, I need someone to link me to the Microsoft documentation on it. Uh, point me to a, a page that tells me how to do it. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Schwalti. Travolti. Um, so this creates the default configuration. Um, use the JSON configuration provider. Okay. And then options is what 2.8 just linked to. Bind hierarchical configuration. The preferred way to read related configuration values is using the options pattern. For example, to read the following configuration values, create the following options. Okay. So this is what uh, people were talking about earlier, where we call configure and pass in the section. Cool. I'm just going to ignore everyone for a little bit while I just do this. <laughs> Though I did like the suggestion of uh, inherit from the JWT options class. So uh, in the auth controller, um, we did spec no cuz the in here the signing credentials actually need to be passed in this is fine okay so um, <laughs> at this point i could do something like um Actually, do I? Yeah, I want a static constructor. So when you. How would I get access to the uh, the configuration, though? Um. The 
dependency injection. <laughs> I don't want a dependency injection. Um, can I get that done automatically, or is there more stuff I need to set up to get it to get to get it going? Can I like add an, an attribute here that automatically injects the config? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna do. It's just gonna be a singleton instance. So that way I actually can pass in the, the configuration. Check it. Okay, now let's actually write some code. So I can say something like uh, JWT options equals a new JWT options. And then on there, the issuer is going to be uh, configuration.get section uh, JWT options. Um, what did I call Did I call it that? No, I just called it JWT. Cool. So this gets put into a variable. Like this. Um, and then we can get the value of issuer. The value is a string. Like that. Great. Yeah, so in C sharp, you can use var, but it's just a shorthand. Basically, whatever the return value of the right hand side is, is the actual type here. It's not dynamic like JavaScript. So get section returns the type i configuration section. So technically, the, the long way to write this is i configuration section, like that. Well, that's a little verbose. I mean, some people prefer that because it's very clear, but. It's also easy if you're like me and you don't know what the return values are because you haven't worked in this that much. Um, all right, we got the issuer. We got the audience. Let's grab the token. Um, and then we need the expiration hours. Did I capitalize everything? No, but we will just to be consistent. All right. This is it. <laughs> I, I realize you all want me to do it automatically, but I, I can't figure it out from the way that I skim documentation, and I don't feel like spending 30 minutes reading stuff. So this is how I'm going to do it. It's going to be fine. Um, okay. Now let's add a static property. Actually, no. Something like constants. Hey, what's up, Shorty Web? Thanks for that resub. Deal with it. <laughs> So yeah, we could we could create like uh, like global constants in here out here, um, and then we can access those from anywhere. There's one line. Okay, if you're really adamant about it, give me the line. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and so uh, C sharp is written by the same same person, same group of people that uh, created TypeScript. Um, same raw. Thanks for the reset. There's probably some other support events. Let me let me get those. Um, yeah, sightseer with the 13 months. Corey Graham. I might have mentioned that, uh, re read these earlier, but thank you for the hundred bits. Bob head with a hundred bits. Can we run SQL map once it's done? What does SQL map do? Um, and Zland Dev with a 12 month resub. He started programming C sharp 10 years ago. You mostly use TypeScript and Rust these days. Nice. Um, I guess it was about 10 years ago that I did C sharp as well. I only I only did it for about five years. And Nazi, thanks for the three months. Shorcy with the 12 months. And Same Raw with the five months. Much appreciated. Um, okay, but what is this going to do? So configure, get section. 
And then... Oh, just for SQL injections. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. We are using the entity entity framework, so it should prevent against most SQL injection. But um, I option snapshot configuration. I don't get it. Like, I, I can add this line of code, but what is that going to give me? And I think services.configure requires some other stuff as well, though. If we look at, um, like, right here. Yeah, configure is a generic method. We do have to pass in a type there. You're saying that I should define the type? So if I have like uh, app config like this, and then pass in the configuration, that's this is what you're saying. Um, and then this, um, crud is create, read, update, delete. We are. <laughs> kind of far away from that though because <laughs> uh, we're trying to get authorization set up and now we're trying to get our configuration set up so at this point though I, ca I can't do this right I can't our app config um, I guess at this point we would just call it JWT config right and then then we just have that class like that. And then uh, over here, this is not app config, this is JWT config. And uh, here we're getting the section JWT. All right. Now what do I do with it? Is it dependency injected? Is it, um, yeah, now how can I use it? So uh, essentially like right here, I need to use it. <laughs> um, I guess technically we're, wait, where did my Firefox go? Oh, there it is. It is so my controller can get it in the constructor. Oh, but what about in, I, I need it in more places than just the uh, the controller. I also need it in startup. Right, yeah. I options snapshot. <laughs> you want to be like me when you grow up. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, Vitara Moretti. Um, where does that come from? But then, yeah, I, if I need it, I need it in the configure services section. I mean, I know I can also, I could like do this. I could get it and then get the specific values. Um, but I want it to be automatic. Startup create constructor. Bob, thanks for that gift. <laughs> Uh, 
I option snapshot is not available. Um, what namespace is it in? Um, does Twitch use Pied Piper for video file compression? Probably not. Uh, we're going to go back to the to the docs over here, because at this point, have we done what it what uh, Sinok Kledev is telling us to do? I option snapshot? Yeah, this is, it's not there. Yeah, I, I realize, okay. Uh, look, uh, At this point, we don't even we don't even need to do that because we can just do this. We can right here. We can say um, options equals this. It doesn't have to be automatic. We could have been done with this an hour ago. Um, great. Uh, we get the section, or sorry, the let's call this the section. And now that we have the section, we can just get the values. Um, does it return a string by default? No, an object. It's in brackets. It's fine. I'm done talking about it. <laughs> I don't. I don't care about it anymore. We're not going to statically type it. We're just going to do this everywhere. We need something from the config, um, which is fine. Issuer, great. And then right here, we can get the token. Great. Now, so these things are coming in from the config. Um, <laughs> and then the other place I was using it was the auth controller. Uh, but what people were telling me is that I can get access to the configuration in the constructor. So if we say auth controller, um, I configuration. Um, great. I think this is technically dependency injection. Um, cause here I can say, uh, configuration equals configuration, the lowercase C like that. And then we'll have a, um, a property on this controller. That can be get and set um, with a capital C, like this. So uh, this is dependency injection because when it creates an instance of my controller, it's going to pass in that configuration, and then I should have access to the same configuration that I got access to over here. So now we can do this. Um, Section dot get value, which is a string. Um, token. Audience. And then, um, expiration hours okay so now this is using the values from my config uh when it's set up it's using the values from my config which is fine and then um later on we can statically type it we, we don't even need this uh, did i already get rid of it no i didn't this we don't need this great uh let's try it out so does it compile it does and does it work? So let's generate a token. Great. And then let's try and use that token. Great. And it works. OK. Now, where were we? Uh, let's actually try to connect to the database now. So <laughs> at this point, um, we have, uh, we've set up our config, 
we have a database running in the background. So for those of you that are, have only recently joined us, we actually do have a Microsoft SQL Server running in a Docker container. Now we want to connect the two. Uh, and we need like a DB connection string. So like in my, my application settings, I'll do something like um, DB connection. And then I'll have to specify it here. Um, DB, DB connect. Uh, I use I use Microsoft SQL Server because we're going full Microsoft. We're using .NET Core, we're using Microsoft SQL Server, all that good stuff. Um, what is the format for a database connection screen, string? Uh, database connection string. It is MS SQL. It is. Um, so here we go. This is what I want. All right, the server is localhost. Uh, the database we need to create, but I'm going to create a database called recipe app. The user ID is SA, which is the default user that the Docker container created. Um, and then we need our database password. Uh, which, what do we do? It's in the Docker Compose. It's this. Like that. Should be fine. Now let's create a database recipe app. I'm just going to do that here. Can I not do that here? <laughs> create database recipe app go it says it did it successfully and we have a we now have a database recipe app but it's totally blank there are no tables all of that's going to be handled by uh, entity framework um, okay so this connection string should be all right um, yeah should be fine now we need to pull this value um, into our uh, DB context. So earlier we created this recipes context. Right now it just like hard coded a, a string here, but this is where we can actually get that um, um, that connection string. Entity framework would create the database. That's interesting. Um, all right. Can I get the configuration dependency injected in here? How do I get access to the configuration? Um, in here. I should not configure it here. Then where? Saying so configure it in startup? Yeah, I guess if I did that, then... Um, I would have access to the configuration. Um, I guess I'll probably have a shared instance. Actually, um, wait. Let's see what people. Let's see what people got. Configure services. Uh, okay, so this is adding like a global DB context that I can use elsewhere. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, here we go. Um, does that mean I don't want to do on configuring here if I'm going to be doing it in startup? So uh, in startup... services.addb context 
with the uh, recipe. What did I call it? Recipes concept context. Um, and then this takes in a lambda function. Yeah. And then we're saying uh, options dot use SQL server, which wasn't there. Might have to use another uh, namespace. There we go. Using entity framework core, use SQL server, and then um, should be able to pass in the connection string. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, in this case, it's doing a configuration dot get connection string. I guess we technically could just, I will, well, I guess we'll do it this way. Cause I was thinking I was just going to have a, um, just like my own little DB connection area, but I, I'm guessing like the preferred way to do it is do something like this. Yeah. You have connection strings. And then inside of here, we'll have the recipe app connection string like that. And then that allows us to do this configuration dot get connection string with recipe app. Yeah. Okay. Recipe app. Awesome. Now what? <laughs> so, um, this is going to add the DB context. Does that just mean I can create an instance of this, this context anywhere and it automatically connects to the database? The context class wants a constructor that looks something like Yeah, yeah. So we should be we're, we're good here. We've added the the database connection. Um I'm just curious DB context options base with those same options. I can inject the DB context into any servers or controller. Ah, okay, perfect. So we've got our database set up, um, our connection anyways. I think at this point is where I actually do want to generate the migrations. I actually do want to create these models as tables in my database. So I need a recipe table. Um, I need a user table, and I, I actually am going to write my own code for um, creating users and logging users in and like cre generating tokens. We'll do that ourselves, which means I should just be able to um, generate the database with this. Um, though, what I do need is uh, some validations on these models. So like I want to make sure that every user has a username, has a password. Uh, we can do validations like min and max length and stuff like that. I am curious though, why did this why did this die? Oh, okay, yeah. Should be fine. Should should compile just fine now. Doesn't compile just fine. <laughs> um add DB context was called with configuration, but the context type recipes context only declares a parameter list constructor. This means that the configuration pass to add db context will never be used. Um I see. We need, uh, this was actually mentioned by someone. We need a, we need a, like a, a, a constructor in here that takes in the options. Yeah. And is it, um, DB context options like this? Super. How's this work? <laughs> um, like that. And then I don't even, do I even need a constructor body? Is this it? Should be it. Let's see if it compiles now. It compiles. Great. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're on our way. Um, yeah, let's let's add some validations to our our classes here. So yeah, I do want to use annotations. So I want to do something like uh, required, like this. Um, and so built into, uh, I guess just .NET in general are these data annotations, but there are also some special annotations we can pull in from Entity Framework. Um, but essentially, these annotations will translate to actual constraints on the 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 database model, the, the SQL that gets this run and stuff like that. Um, annotations are discouraged? Come on. I know that there's they have the Fluid API now where you can you can do it within that. Um, what's wrong with annotations? Annotations are great. The other cool thing about this is uh, these annotations get pulled into into Swagger. So once I have some routes with that inv involve users, um, all the annotations get shown here as like a required attribute on the on the object and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I need to do some annotations. Let's get rid of this other stuff. Um, entity framework core annotations. Yeah, uh, so I do want to do something like key. I feel like key will probably get set by default, but we might as well specify it. So in our in our base model, we have the ID, which should be the key. Um, the other thing is the like the created at should have a de default date, like that, and updated at. So when we create a record, it has those values by default. Um, and then I can specify like a min length on the username and stuff like that. Max length, do max length and min length. So min length, I think would be an example of uh, like a, an actual validation that's running at, at the application layer, but then max length is gonna be an actual constraint on the database. Um, so let's say the username must be at least two characters and no more than 50 characters. And the password must be a minimum of eight characters with no with no max length. I think the if I think it's gonna do a varchar though, so it would max to 255. We'll just be explicit. Right? Right? Um, if I've created at, I can do column created at. Well, um, if so, if you're saying if I want to specify uh, what the column name actually should be, I'm actually just going to leave it. So in my database, it'll it'll be camel case named, right? Oh yeah, I'll group them together. That sounds good. Um, I mean, who has a password that's 255 characters long? I guess it's possible. It's possible to do that. <laughs> um, what are some other validations I can do? What's the difference between min length and string length? Uh, oh, can, string length can only be pro uh, applied to um, uh, string properties. That's fine. Um, Oh, you're right. You're right. Uh, we actually we're storing hash. We're going to be storing hashed passwords. So uh, let's just. I mean, <laughs> let's go with five hundred. Um. Yeah. And actually, we we can't even. Um, we can't even say what the min length would be because we're going to be storing bcrypt hashes. Yeah, we're going to go with 512. It's perfect. Um, we do want foreign key uh, on our recipe model. So our recipe has this uh, creator, um, but this is a foreign key 
to creator ID. Um, and so this should create the, the foreign key constraint for us. Timestamp. Table, yeah, we can also specify the table name, but if we don't specify the table name, it's just going to use the name of the class. So we'll have a table called recipe and a table called user. Um, Carrie is saying I can put required here too. I'm okay with that. Okay, uh, what, what, um, Sinak, Sin Colo, Sik Olo Dev is mentioning that I actually don't need, um, this foreign key here if I use naming convention. I'm gonna leave it, but it's good to know that I don't, it's not required. Um, let's add some validations here. So, um, similar thing, title will be required. Um, we won't have a min length, but we'll have a math max length of, I don't know, uh, a hundred. Then content is required max length of a thousand. So content is like, uh, the actual text of the recipe. So we're, we'll, we'll let them, um, Christian, I'll call you Christian, <laughs> Christian Nikolov. <laughs> Um, but uh, so I'll max that out at a thousand just so the recipes don't get too big um, and then the image URL will be similar but I'm not gonna require it image URL could be null um, max that at 2048 and then uh, creator ID is required because you have to have a creator Cool. Anything else? I think that's it. I think we're ready to generate our database based on these models. Can anybody think of anything else that I need to do with these two models? Well, technically, if you include our base model. Does this look good, or do I need to add anything else? Uh, don't even need to have creator ID. Um, Entity from our core will create a shadow property. Okay. Do I need a virtual for the foreign key? I don't think so. We can see how they did it over here. Um, in this case, they just had like order ID and order. So I don't think so. Seems fine. All right, let's generate the database. <laughs> um, so I know I can do update. There's also um, .NET EF um, database mi migrations add. Okay, this is what I want. I believe if I run this command, um, it is going to create an initial migration with those two tables. Let's see. Uh, let's kill it. <laughs> so we're going to add uh, the initial migration. It says it did it, but let's see what it made. So if we look at our folder, uh, we now have a migrations folder. This has an initial migrations file, and we can see the code that it generated. So this is saying create table users, add all of these columns, specify a primary key. Um, great. Create table recipes. And then we have a primary key of ID and a foreign key that points to users. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So that created the migrations. And then uh, Nikolov is right. We need to uh, actually run it against the database because our database right now is still totally empty. Um, could refresh it. There are no tables here. We've generated the code that will create the tables. Now we actually need to uh, need to run it. Does it just update? Let's 
It's probably a, another command. Um, database update. Yeah, that's it. All right. Create the tables. Oh, it's trying. <laughs> uh, build succeeded. All right. So that essentially just ran some stuff against my database. And now look at this. We've got uh, two, two tables. We've got the users table. Um, recipes table. We can look at all the columns. We can see that they have constraints. So all of these are not null and um, have like a specific length. Beautiful. All right, now we can actually get to coding. <laughs> Is that um, at this point, um, we have the database, we have the initial tables. Uh, let's actually create some auth endpoints for creating new users. Here we go. Because um, our auth controller could have a, um, a route. Well, actually, I mean, technically, we probably want a users controller. Because our users controller we can make a post request there to create the user, and then we'll, after creating the user, we can hit the auth endpoint to um, log that user in and get a token. So we'll do this. Um, of our users controller. Um, we'll start here. Remove this stuff. What did Pablo say? Oh, yeah. Uh, have yet to receive my code sheet. Sure, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I don't know, Pablo. Uh, didn't, were you the one that that posted in the Discord? I think if you, if you open a, um, a support ticket with them... I'm sure they'll help you out because I don't really have any control over what they do. Um, but I would say definitely open a support ticket. They, they'll hopefully send you a replacement. We want to see 100% test coverage. I'm exhausted. There's no way we're going to do 100% test coverage. Uh, we're not going to do any tests, actually. We're just going to do uh, dev testing. Um... Okay, so we have a controller. Uh, this is for creating users. So I'll actually, you'll be able to hit these endpoints without being authorized. Um, because if we make a post request here, we want to insert a user into the database. Um, yeah, uh, DM me on Discord, Pablo. I can, I can try to help you out, see, if, see what's going on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> We want to create a user. So we actually, we need a constructor. And um, just like earlier, we saw that we could, um, actually, no, we didn't see this, but we should be able to um, have a dependency on the recipe um, context. And this should get dependency injected. Um, and then I can just have a, um, a variable, a, a property on this controller that is the context itself. Which is of type recipes context. like this. So we should get access to that context here. And then whenever we make a create request, actually for now, let's just, let's just do this, um, to see it working. We'll do a, a list of the database table. So this should return a list of, uh, users. Um, and right here is where we can, we can do the business. Um, so I can do, uh, context, dot um, users <laughs> context dot users so this is this is actually now we're going to be talking to the database 
And then I can I think I can just do two lists. So this will literally do select star from users, and then uh, we'll get the return value. So this this will be our users, and then here we'll just return the users. Um, now, if I did if I did everything right, we should get back an empty array. But yeah, th these are some things we want to do. We want to like wrap it in action results, so that way we can um, specify. Uh, like a good result with this 200 status code versus a bad result, that kind of thing. So I'm using var because it's shorthand. I mean, technically, I would have to do this if I didn't want to use var. But var was a whole lot easier to type, so I'm going to do that. All right. Uh, is it still... Let's see if it'll compile. It compiles. And we have a user's endpoint, and um, we'll make a request, and it returns an empty array. Beautiful. Now, at this point, um, I can show you some of the cool things about uh, the fact that it that Swagger is automatically gem generated, um, the fact that we have automatic documentation. So, um, really, all all we did was we defined like a user class here. So we defined the class. NED Framework automatically created the database table for us and all the migrations. Beautiful thing. Swagger is able to pull in that model definition and actually give us example documentation. Um, so Swagger is able to generate the say that, hey, the, this is what the response is going to look like if we have users. And then the other thing is in the documentation down here, it was able to generate um, the schema for what a user looks like. Um, so. It's a beautiful thing. It's actually, I mean, it took us a lot to get set up, mainly because I'm not used to this. But once you're set up, you're flying. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, now, at this point, we actually want to uh, be able to create a user. Um, but before we do that, we should do the, the action result thing. Um... Is that, do I need to import something? Or is it just action result? Yeah, it's just action result. Um, but what I can do here is like this. Okay, so um, that uh, will respond with the 200 status code and have the users as the, um, the body of the, the response. Um, another thing you could do though, um, is you can do um, like a, like a not found, and then you can also specify the payload. So I could have like a little dynamic object in here. Um, now this code won't run, but this is now going to automatically give us a 404 status code with that response body. In the end, the other thing is we should probably be doing this asynchronously because this is technically blocking on that specific thread. There's a, there's a lot of different things we could do, but let's just see this. We should now get a not found response uh, with a 404 status code. Yeah, so we get a 404. That's what the not found gave us, but then it took our uh, thing that we passed into it and made that the body of the response. Um, okay. Yeah, so... T technically what we want is we want a task that returns an action result and technically we should use uh, to list async um, so this now returns a task so that way we can await it um, and this now needs to be an async function so if you're familiar with JavaScript async await it's it's similar in, in the way that you use it, in that you could think of this as like it's returning a promise. It's basically halting the execution of the function. Um, I will say, under the hood, it is very different, though, because this is technically like a separate thread. And um, you could actually have multiple multiple of these things happening. That, that, like, here you actually can run into race, condition, race conditions. Um, but that's the way to go. Um, Cool. Yeah. Um, this is fine. 
<laughs> Let's make a create endpoint. Yeah, and somebody mentioned earlier that I should technically create like a a services file, and then that service, like a, I could create a user service, and the user service is the class that actually um, uses the context and makes the database queries. I'm not going to do that just because I don't have to. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to. Um, so we need a create endpoint. When I when I make a post request here with a user payload, it should insert it into the database. Um, and this should give us the, the user that they're trying to create. And then we'll return the created user as well. Um, so we'll have our uh, created user will be context.users. Um, I think it's something like this, context dot add. Is there an async add? Yeah, add async user. So uh, that's going to put them into the user's repository. And then we need to save changes to the repository. So we can do this um, dot Save changes async. So um, the way this works is essentially like when you add them, they're just like in memory. Um, and um, yeah, well, we will need to await that. It's, it's like in memory. And then uh, if you, but you, if you actually want to write it to the database, you do save changes and it actually does the SQL insert. Um, and here we should be able to return the created user. Um, and, and part of saving it will be when it inserted in, inserts it into the database, it'll assign it an ID. And so the thing that we respond with um, should actually be um, the thing that was inserted. Um, the other thing is, though, before putting them in the database, we need to hash the password. Um, so let's do that. Uh, this is a web API, so this isn't even... Um, yeah, we're not using Blazor. We're not really even using MVC. But we need we need bcrypt. Need to hash a password. You what are they doing here? <laughs> Key derivation. Um, I guess there's a separate like bcrypt package. Yeah, bcrypt.net, which we get from NuGet. I'm fine with this. All that oppose speak now because I'm gonna do it anyways um, so we're gonna add the bcrypt dependency this is gonna let us uh, hash some passwords like this and then we'll use the verification um, whenever we're logging users in so I can say user dot password equals uh, this um, and we'll we'll just use this namespace. Um, is that not what it is? That should be fine. So basically when they make um I don't have I don't have identity core set up. Yeah. Um we didn't set that up. I'm just gonna go this route because I kind of don't want to work on this anymore. So we just need to get it done. Um hash the password. So user.password is gonna be the password that they sent in the request. We're then gonna hash that and then override it with the hashed version, and then the hashed version should be what gets inserted into the database. Um, I think this is fine. Let's see what it gets, uh, complains about. No, it builds, great. 
Um, and then now I should be able to create a user. Um, so we're going to try it out. This is what's cool about Swagger. And, and also I talked about earlier the, um, like the, the documentation generation. The fact that it gives me an example to work with is pretty sweet. Uh, but my username is CJ, and then my password is super secret. Now, if this works, we should get back a response that has uh, the ID from the database. Great. And it also has the hashed password. Um, and we actually uh, don't want to send that in the response. Uh, but it worked. It worked. We hashed the password. They're in our database. Um, and that's awesome. But in the response, we actually don't want the password property. I think there's, um, yeah, I, the JSON ignore is, is basically what I want. Um, because whenever we're serializing it from a from a user object into JSON, we don't want to include the password. Um, though, will that affect the value that's being sent to the server? Um, technically, yeah, you're right. Technically, we could generate the token at this point and then respond with the token, so that way, whatever front end we build could instantly log them in after creating the user. Um, what am I doing? JSON ignore. So that needs to be on the user model here on password. Cool. Um, though I probably should have brought in uh, Newtonsoft JSON. It's what I use at work. I know there are some limitations of the built-in JSON serialization. Yeah, let's see. OK, so now that we added JSON ignore, we should be able to, uh, OK. Compiled successfully. Let's try creating a new user. Um, yeah, so you can see uh, in the in the definition here, it's now missing password, um, which I don't want. Um, I mean. This is why we use DTOs. What's a DTO? <laughs> Blank out. So the the issue is um, the the password then would then be like null in the response, which is fine. Data transfer object. So what you're saying is I need to create a a new class that is call it created user that only has an ID and a username and doesn't have a password. And that's the thing that I respond with. Is this is that what you're saying? Yeah, new class for hiding properties. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, let's do it. <laughs> um, should I create a new folder for DTO, data transfer objects? Um, should I put it in data? Where should I put it? Yeah, the um, I'm trying to think. Okay, so our database context would use the user class as we has it, have it, have it, not has it, have it. But our um, our controller would be the thing that uses the DTO class. Records. Yeah, I'm tempted to do this. All right, for anybody that has been, no, but actually, I still I want the Swagger documentation to be at least a little bit right. Um, I'm gonna create it. I'm gonna put it in the models folder. Some people are saying it's a, it's not a model. Okay, we'll create we'll create a DTO folder. Data transfer objects, and we'll create a user class in here um, that doesn't have a password. So they have a um, username. They have an ID. And a created at and an updated at. Let's 
What is auto mapper then? Uh, this is absolutely backend work. Yeah, so we're writing C sharp code that eventually would be compiled and running on a server somewhere. This this code could not run inside of a web browser. User DTO, sure, but I mean it's in the DTO namespace. Um, okay, so we have this wonderful little DTO class here, and then now in our controller, we can use it. You know, I don't hate DTOs. I hate that people are, I mean, I guess it's something that we do often enough that it makes sense to have an acronym for it. Um, but the thing is, in the JavaScript world, we don't really need them because we can just create objects on the fly. Um, and so you have like a middleware that just like removes properties from an object without having to create a, a separate class type for it. I don't know. Um, all right. This will accept a user which has a password property. And then the thing that we're actually returning is a user DTO. Um, and the user DTO will just... Uh, we could do auto mapper. I don't know. I'm I'm already tired of this. <laughs> I think we, we wasted so much time just getting configuration and authorization working. Um, we really should be focusing on the CRUD because we haven't even touched that yet. Technically, right now, we're creating users, though. Uh, regardless. Here we go. Um, create a user DTO. Why don't you know where it is? Find it. Oh well. Oh, I think I put it in the wrong namespace. <laughs> um, oh, it's here. I created the folder outside the project. You're totally right. Thank you for that. I did. Okay, now it should pick it up. All right, and then uh, really we just need the, the username, which is user.username. We need the uh, ID. We need the uh, created at. And we need the uh, updated at. And I think that is it, right? Should be fine. Um, does it compile? Oh, we I, yeah, that's why I wasn't getting an error before on the DTO. Um, I'm missing some some things here. Okay, it compiles. Now, uh, let's try creating another user. And in this case, so this is kind of what I wanted because. Um, the the payload that we're sending does actually include a password, but the, the payload that we get back um, does not. Yeah, so the payload we're sending includes a password, but the payload, the example payload that we're seeing doesn't have a password, and that's what I want. So if we create a new user um, that has the username Nikolov and the password secret, super secret, uh, we should get back a beautiful little DTO. Look at that DTO. It's got no password on it. So that's great. Um, the other thing is, though, when we query the database, um, it's going to have passwords on it. So check it out. We have this list endpoint. Look at all those passwords. <laughs> um, so technically, we could... I don't know if there I don't know if there's a good way to do this though because if I let's say I get back a thousand records from the database do I have to map over each record from the database and map it to a DTO? Um I don't want to do that, but I guess you're I guess it could, it could we could use a link their language integrated query, but in the real world would it have like implications um in terms of how much Iterating it has to do to map it to this, these DTOs. 
auto mapper. That makes sense. <laughs> Let's just use an auto mapper. Um, it's fine though. Let's let's fix this endpoint. So the get endpoint right now, which is doing two list async. Um, I think we can have uh, we have map if we use um, are we using system dot link? We are using system link. Should I look into auto mapper? I really don't want to. Um, does this have a map? It's select. Ah, okay, thank you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Or do we want select mini? Um, so check it out. Now we have a nice little lambda function that can return our little thing. So I probably should be using auto mapper. I I don't I don't feel like setting anything else up. Um, select mini. DB set of user does not contain a definition for select mini and no acceptable extension. What am I missing? With no type argument? Oh. Oh. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, so here's, I think here's the issue with putting it after to list is like this, this is essentially the equivalent of reading all of the records from the database into memory and then iterating over that list in memory and creating a new list here, which is fine. There's only two users in our database. Um, but wait, what do I? Can I remove the return? Can I just do uh, that? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a lot more stuff here, Julian, though. Um, I do realize that. Like, we're doing auth. We've got this swagger stuff. Oh, 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 oh. I see. Uh, like this. Yeah. Um, and this responds with uh, an I enumerable of user DTO. Now, I, like, this is not at all any reason why I wouldn't use C sharp. Like this is totally fine. The thing is like, this is project setup. There's also um, just a lot of stuff that, I mean, I haven't touched C sharp in so long. Things have changed so that I would have to learn those things. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the end result is actually a beautiful thing. Like the, the amount of work it would take to, to get a node express object to have like auto generated schemas and auto gen generated swagger without some like without some actual work would be pretty hard in the javascript land um so yeah uh we tried this a second ago 28 uh the this is it just going to work now <laughs> what i think the only difference was I had a return statement. We 
Beautiful. All right. Now that we've done that, um, I had a, okay, I had a semicolon. Okay. I didn't see it. Now that we've done that, we no longer expose the passwords from the database. <laughs> Great. Technically, though, uh, we can only list users if you're logged in. So check this out. Throw the authorized attribute on there. And now uh, we should get a unauthorized when we try to list the users because we're not logged in. Unauthorized. Great. Uh, now let's create a, um, a login endpoint. <laughs> um, we'll create an auth endpoint where we can send our username and password. If it's right, generate a token. So we already have an auth controller. And uh, just to test things out, we were just generating a token automatically. Um, but we basically can reuse this code. Does the token, um, can it accept more properties? The return it shouldn't have new user DTO in the list. Here? What are you talking about? Here? Uh, Hatula, are you asking about uh, these here? These are known as uh, attributes. So um, uh, these allow you to uh, uh, their they're annotations, their attributes. They, they let you specify some, some more metadata about a specific function, and then this metadata is used elsewhere. So in the case of this controller, uh, Swagger actually uses this metadata to know that this is an HTTP GET request. Um, and then also when it's setting up all of the request handlers, it knows that it should uh, run this function if an HTTP GET request comes into this specific controller. So these are like little annotations. For your for your methods and such. Okay, what am I doing? I really want to be able to reuse this, but also in my token, I want to be able to specify like the user ID, claims, date, time, credentials. Are they just claims? Is that what these are known as? Um, let's look at a claim. Type and value. Ah, oh, okay. Seems easy enough. Yeah. Um, so we can do audience claims. Like that, like ID one. Something like that, but uh, we're not gonna hard code it. We'll actually pass the user object in and then that's what we'll specify the claim. So here's what I'm gonna do. This is no longer a get method. This is just like a utility method. Um, create token, and this takes in the uh, user. And then when we specify a claim, the ID will take in the user ID. Uh, we want it to be a string though. And then we'll also have the username. Um, as a claim, like that. 
So now the token will have ID and username inside of it. And later on, we could use that token for an authorized user to get their user information. Um, so this should be fine. Now we've got the method for creating a token. Won't be public though. That's just an internal method that'll be used by the auth controller. Um, and then we want an HTTP post um, for logging in. Um, we'll have to create like a token response type. Um, so login is going to take in a user object. Um, and it should respond. For now, we'll just say it responds with the token, but we'll create a custom object. Um, great. Now. When they log in, they're sending the username and password uh, to the server. We then need to look up that user in our database. Um, so we should be able to use the DB context. We don't have it, but we want it just like in the user's controller. So the user's controller uh, got the database context. We want to do a very similar thing over in our auth controller. Like this. So that should be dependency injected. We'll have a database context that we can actually use. And then right here, we'll do the business. So we'll say um, context dot users dot font uh, first, first or default async. Um, so this this will either find them in the database or not. If it doesn't find them in the database, this, this is an invalid login. If it does find them, we need to validate their password. Um, yeah, so we'll say if a found user does uh, is equal to null, then we're actually just going to return a not found result. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to do a where clause a where a where clause. <laughs> um, so this is going to get each uh, user. We want where user dot uh, username is equal to user dot name. Hey everyone, how's it going? <laughs> Thanks for the raid, the primogen. <laughs> Welcome in, friends. Uh, we're writing some C sharp today, which is a very unusual thing for me to do here. But uh, I'll give you a. Let me finish this up. I'll give you a quick quick tour of all the stuff that we've done so far. Um. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome in. What were you? Uh, what were you working on, Primogen? <laughs> uh, crud, crud me up, Daddy. <laughs> cool. Uh, but what we're doing right now is we we looked up a user in the database by username. Uh, if we didn't find them, then we're gonna throw a not found message. Um. It just says uh, uh, not found. It's fine. Should be fine. Um, how do we protect against SQL injection? So this is where I think Entity Framework will handle it for us. So uh, this username is coming from the payload of the request, but I believe Entity Framework is going to take this where statement, turn it into a actual SQL query, and it does the parameterization. So it actually removes uh, any potential injections. Yeah. Um, so if the found user was null, we say not found. Um, otherwise, we just say OK. message to do finish this handler okay let's see if this works and then um i'll give you all a tour of what we worked on okay okay so we should be able to attempt to make a 
post request. Actually, I want to I want to map this to slash login. Isn't there like a uh, route? Can I do like a uh, login something like that? Yeah, this is what I want. And you're absolutely right, 28. <laughs> I love to I love to create these little anonymous objects. This is a beautiful new C# -sharp feature. This this um this feature did not exist whenever I was working in C# -sharp back in the day. Just like little on the fly anonymous object with whatever properties you want on it. Um I'm going to combine them, Andy. Let's see if that works. Compiling Great, great. Okay, so uh, at this point, we should be able to try logging in. Um, with uh, some username that doesn't exist in the system like Bob and we should get back a not found. And we do great. But if we pass in someone that does exist like my username, we get back to do finish this handler. <laughs> Great. Um, well, welcome everyone. So um, this is the coding garden. If you've if you've never been here before, we write a lot of code, and usually, I do a whole lot of JavaScript. Um, I really like JavaScript. JavaScript is a beautiful thing. I use it a lot. It works well for me. I like it. But today we've been been um, exploring. Uh, .NET Core, and I actually am using uh, .NET Core Web API at my job at work. I'm a software consultant. Um, I just have never used it on stream because I like using JavaScript so much on stream. On stream. Um, good point, Fuzzy Life. Yeah, we actually don't need to take in the user object, but we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, so what we've we've done so far is, is like a lot. I mean, I've been live for like four hours at this point. But essentially, uh, initially, we actually installed the .NET Core uh, SDK because I'm on a Mac. We installed it for Mac. We generated a web API project. Uh, we talked about NuGet, which is how they manage their, their packages and such in uh, the .NET world. Uh, we then set up a Docker container. So we have a Docker compose file that spins up a Microsoft SQL server. So this is, yeah, this is how... Um, how weird this all is. Like, I'm, I'm writing code on a Mac. That Mac is running Microsoft SQL Server, and that Mac is also running the, the .NET framework, which is pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, so Docker is running in the background for that database server. And then um, we're using Entity Framework in .NET to hook it all up. So uh, let's look back at this. Yeah. Um, Entity Framework is a cool uh, ORM object relational mapper where you can do something like this. Basically, all we did uh, was we specified a, a table base model. So every database table we have is going to have an ID and it's going to have uh, some timestamps on it. And then we specified our, our user table. Um, they have these nice little uh, annotations that let us specify uh, some validations. But uh, the user table has two fields, username and password. Um, and then similarly, uh, oh yeah, all of this is a recipe app. <laughs> we're, we're, ma we're making an API that will store recipes. And so a recipe has a title, content, image, and creator. Um, so uh, we, we did what's called code first. So what we did is we created these classes and then we just ran a command. Uh, we ran, um, what was it? Dot net ef database migrate migrate update ef migrate there was a command basically we ran a command yeah and uh it took this c sharp code that i've written and turned it into code that would actually generate the database tables so this code was generated our initial migration so it actually generated the the database generation code which is pretty sweet um, and then we ran these migrations against our database. So now we actually have a recipes table and a users table. Yeah, so first we migrated, then we updated the database. Yep, yep, yep. Um, that's pretty much it. We spent an inordinate amount of time <laughs> getting our configuration working. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and I, can, I can talk a little bit about the history. So uh, the .NET Core is like the open source version of the .NET framework, but it, it was actually initially released in 2016. Um, and uh, it's it's been a journey because they haven't had full like cross-platform support 
when it started, but they eventually got that. And now we're at a point where they're going to drop the word core. Now it's not going to be .NET Core anymore. It's just going to be .NET. But basically everything .NET is totally cross-platform. Yeah, so we're using .NET 5, which is technically .NET Core. And we also learned that Xamarin is not Xamarin anymore. It's called MAUI, but it's, it originated as Xamarin. Microsoft has come a long way. I'll just say, I'll just say that. Um, how do I view SQL tables in, uh, in Microsoft code? Uh, yeah, so this is the MS SQL extension. We actually just set up a database connection. And we were able to connect to it. Um, Xamarin and Blazor equals MAUI? Really? I thought MAUI was more like the cross-platform mobile development thing. I don't know. Right now, we are just building an API, though. So um, we, we, we don't have any server-side rendered views or anything like that. This is all just a J JSON data. Um, but yeah, we spent a ton of time just trying to read in this configuration in a nice way. I think, I mean, ultimately, code's not that hard to, to read in this configuration file, but um, I was trying to do it like statically typed, and that took forever. Uh, what else took forever? Yeah, just figuring out... Th there's actually a minimum length token you can use for the, the built-in... Uh, JSON web token thing, which I had never come across. I don't know. Yeah, JSON web token headaches for sure, for sure. Um, but at this point, let's let's keep working because uh, I've been live for a really long time. And um, yeah, here we go. We're gonna get this login endpoint working. I'm, I might actually end it after I after I get all the login stuff working, and then next time. We can sit down in an already configured, already ready to go uh, project and just create the recipes controller. Because that's going to be a whole lot less work. We basically just, it, it's easy. We just query the database, put recipes in, take recipes out, all that good stuff. Um, it's a token. Actually, no, you're right. It is a secret. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to rename it, though. So here's here's the thing about um, not having a statically typed uh, settings file. If I were to rename this to secret, I have at least three places I need to change to read in the right value. Whereas if I would have created a static class, not static, a, a strongly typed class that parses this thing, I could have just changed it in, in one place. Doesn't matter though. We're gonna leave it. Um, here we go. Now we're working on a login method. So this is how login works. You submit your username and password. Um, and someone mentioned um, we could do something like this: username password. Now, I believe there's an attribute we can specify that says like these values are coming from the body rather than being like query parameters. Um, let's just see what happens if we do this. And we'll see you, Julian. Um, thanks for hanging out. From body. I think that's what we want. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see what happens if we don't do that. So I'm saying the login method takes in username and password. Uh, now what? Yeah, so th by default, it does the query string. We don't want that. We want like a JSON body. Um, I mean, is it just like... Like that. Oh, no. <laughs> we failed to compile. Uh, let's see why. has more than one parameter that was specified or inferred as the following parameters. What? Only one is needed? Like that? Weird. Oof. Oh, I see. I I might have to create a new DTO <laughs> or like a, a new custom type that only has a, 
a username and a password in it. Because then I could say, um, like, right? Is that what I'm going to have to do? I really don't want to do that. Yeah, I have to see. I have to create a class with two strings. Whew. Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. I didn't want to do it. Like, it. It's not. It's not horrible though, because I mean, let's just call it the login user. <laughs> and we're gonna put this in our. Because uh, technically, this is a DTO. It's a data data tran data data transfer object. Um, because it's the data that's transferred when logging in a user, right? Uh, which is just the username and the password. It's a record? What do you mean it's a record? Public record. Oh, I've never done that. Is that a, that's a C-sharp thing? Immutable structs. Record is just really short syntax. Can I create them on the fly? Or do I have to do something like... Um... What was the syntax? All right, um, my syntax highlighter doesn't like it. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna look at, I mean, it's not much worse than this because it really is only two properties that I need. Using record types. Public record type the values. I don't know if I'm using C sharp nine. I'm um, I'm in .NET five. If that, if that means anything, <laughs> um, I'm I'm not gonna worry about it. Oh, if I'm using okay, well then why don't I have the syntax highlighting? Does this compile? No, the type or namespace. Oh. This actually compiles. It just doesn't have very good syntax highlighting. Because um, then over here, this is a login user DTO. Nope. Whoa. It works. Well, that's nice. <laughs> it just doesn't have very good syntax highlighting. I'm fine with that, because that's really all we need. It's an object with two properties, username and password. It's magic. It's all just magic. Um, great. Great, great, great. Now, the standard process for logging in is you look up that user in the database for that specific username, right? Um, does it... If it doesn't exist, you don't log them in. If it does exist, we then need to compare the password. Um, so we'll have to do um, the bcrypt thing. This. Dot uh, equals? Is this the method we want? No. I'm not, yeah, I'm not using identity. I probably should have. I wouldn't say for fun. I would say for, for lack of knowing that that's a thing that I could be using. Um, yeah, so we're going to use verify. Okay, so um, this text is the password that they're logging in with. So we'll do user.password. And then the hash comes from the actual database. Like that. 
Does this throw an exception? Does this, it just returns a Boolean. Cool, so we'll say, uh, if valid, then we're gonna return an okay response um, with a nice little dynamic object. It has a token property that's equal to um, create token for that user. Should be fine. Uh, if not, um, we want some. We want like a unauthorized. Is it unauthor? Is it? Um, it's not a. It is not a dynamic object. It's an anonymous object. It's good. It's good to know that you're not being pedantic. I mean, maybe you are, but I don't care. <laughs> it's fine. Um, in um, in JavaScript, this would be like a dynamically created. Uh, this would be like an object literal. Bad request. That's probably what I want. Yeah. And now we have our anonymous object. Um, I mean, technically, when you're doing this, you all, you don't want to be too specific. You don't be like, oh, we found that user, but the password's wrong. You just say. I mean, we could, we'll just do we'll just do this. It's it's fine. Nobody use this code. I'm telling you right now. Don't use this code in the real world. Um, should be fine. All right. Now the moment of truth. We're going to attempt. Well, first, if we log in with, uh, try to log in with Jim, that user is not found. Great. If we try to log in with me and the wrong password, we should get bad password. Great. But if we log in with the right password should get back a token and we do look at that and then now i can use this token to request the weather <laughs> uh, because if i try this without a token this is currently an authorized endpoint so it says it's unauthorized but if i use that token we just generated um should work look at that we can get a random weather forecast Whew. um you know what? I I, I kind of want to look into identity. So uh, people mentioned it earlier. Basically, if we use identity, we don't have to do any of this manually. Identity would handle that for us. It would generate the tokens. Um, it probably could even query the database for us. That's probably what I want. Yeah, it'll it'll uh hash oh hash the password. That makes sense because right now, technically, I have like a manual create route that. Uh, actually hashes the password and then inserts the user into the into the database. So yeah, I'll just I'll just put let's get let's give myself a to do. To do use identity. Stop doing things manually. <laughs> uh, a better wrong password response is to check database for passwords and ask if they were meaning. Oh yeah, did you mean this password now? But we're not storing the passwords in plain text which is a good thing. You can you can you can follow that example. Don't store passwords in, in plain text. The new minimal APIs feature will also reduce a lot of the boilerplate required for writing HTTP. Yeah, I'm I'm curious because I know other people have mentioned this as well. Um, <laughs> Cuz um I mean we spent a lot of time setting up but like th like in the grand scheme of things, it really wasn't that much. The, the thing is, like, once the project is all set up and ready to go, you just write your code. You just you just talk to the database. You just implement some uh, request handlers. It's not all configuration all the time. Um, and I did talk about this earlier, but what I really like is how everything is um, fairly automatic in that I just create the model. I instantly get a database table. I also instantly get that, that same exact model um, is used for the API documentation, which it should be. Yeah. <laughs> Will the to-do tag live forever? Maybe. No, we'll, we'll revisit it next week. It'll be, it's, it's nice to take a break from JavaScript. Um, so next week we can, we can work on this as well because next week is where we will actually crud the recipes. And jive off. Thanks for the bits. Uh, what was I about to do? Yeah, I was going to look up this article that was shared.
write a minimal API in, with three lines of code. I need a web application. When you make a git request here, it should return hello world, run the app. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, is it that easy to make an HTTP request? It wasn't always this way. <laughs> I remember it being a lot more difficult back in the day. Um, cool. You can return a model. Uh, this seems great. Uh, when it, When is it going to be released? Um, or is it? .NET 6. Cool. Seems fine. Um, yeah, there was, there was a question, though. November. Great. I'll be looking out for it. Um, the question, yeah. What, what would be the main benefit of writing this stuff in C Sharp rather than TypeScript and JavaScript? Uh, like, is it faster, more stable, more secure? Um, I think the is it faster or is it more stable really depends on your code base itself. Like, if I were to take this exact code base and like what it what it wants to be like in terms of it, this wants to be a, a, crud, a recipe recipes crud api with log login I, I would say you you if the the speed the the speed and stability difference between this and the same implementation in node.js would be like you, you couldn't even tell like it's just an api works just fine uh is it more secure i mean at the end of the day i, I would be using the same security mechanisms in node like i would be using json web tokens and i'd be validating the tokens um i think the the main benefits or the main differences is the developer experience um now there there were quite a few things in here where we had to create us we had to create a class we had to create a static type for the stuff we were trying to do whereas in in like node.js you wouldn't have to do that you could just like create objects on the fly and not have to statically type everything um, and I, I like that. Um, I mean, I went from doing C sharp for like five years or so into, into the JavaScript world where everything was super dynamic. Um, and I really appreciated that cause I was coming from a background of everything being super statically typed. Um, but now that I've been in JavaScript land for a long time, I know how easy it is for people to write really messy dynamic code. Um, because JavaScript does let you do whatever you want. Um, so I like this. I'll say like the, cause I've been, I've been working in uh, .NET and C sharp at work for like the past few months. And I mean the, how simple it was to get swagger up and going to get automatic documentation. All of this stuff is su super sweet and would usually take a lot more work to get this done in like a node express app. Um, similarly, like the working with a database, like if you've seen me do JavaScript stuff for databases, I typically use like uh, connects.js, which is fairly manual. Like I actually am writing uh, migration scripts that update the tables like very manually versus just changing a model file and then it handling all of that for me. So I don't know. I, I, I think it really just comes down to developer preference because at the end of the day, the API is gonna basically work the same way as if it was written with Node. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could you could argue about the performance difference, but I would say, like, in the grand scheme of things, it <laughs> it's minuscule compared to like how you write your application code and and how you document things, and that, that's really where the main differences come into play. You potentially would get similar benefits with TypeScript, but to me, I, I TypeScript is often more of a nuisance. In JavaScript, so not not in general. So think about like the way I, in my experience is that the the hoops I have to jump through for C sharp to create the types are not as much of a nuisance as the hoops I have to jump through in TypeScript to get rid of like TypeScript compiler errors and compiler warnings. Like C sharp seems a lot more thought out than TypeScript, and I think the reason is like TypeScript is backwards compatible with JavaScript. Like there's a lot of weird stuff that JavaScript does in there that TypeScript has to account for. Uh, I don't know. C to me, working with C-sharp is actually easier than working with TypeScript. Mm. It's your boss or tech lead that decides the tech, not the developer. Yeah, it, whoever's in charge. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and there are libraries of Node that help with this kind of like automatic database mapping thing, but um, none of them are as nice as Entity Framework, at least in my experience. Entity Framework is really nice. There might be something out there that's similar to Entity Framework for Node, but I haven't found it or used it. Okay, I think I'm going to go because I've been live for almost five hours at this point. Um, and we didn't get everything done, but we did get quite a, get, quite a bit done. Um, and I am going to push this all up to GitHub. Yeah, I mean, really, we left off at this last part. Like, we, we need to... Probably next time, we'll rip out all of our custom off and get identity working. And then we'll create the actual create, read, update, delete routes for, for this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this, yeah, the same person that made C-sharp made uh, TypeScript as well, which is where it was all influenced from. But they do have the baggage of... Uh, TypeScript has JavaScript baggage in its implementation. Um, is that it? That's all? Yeah, yeah, you're very welcome, PokePew. And I, I am going to push this up to GitHub so you can click on these links and uh, try to do similar things that I was doing here today. <laughs> Uh, Dapper can be used instead of Entity Framework. Uh, is it is it a C sharp thing, or is it a, a JavaScript thing? It's a micro ORM. Oh, oh! The fact that they just have SQL statements here, I don't like. It. I mean, the, like the whole point of an ORM is so you, that you don't have to write code like this. Um, do they have some sort of ORM piece of it? I don't know. I might check it out one day. Let me push this up to GitHub really quick, just so I don't forget. Oh, uh, Paul, are you asking about the VOD? Because I noticed that. I was going to edit it to upload to YouTube, and the VOD on Twitch just, like, cut, like, 20 or 30 minutes out. Is that what you're talking about from last week's stream? Yeah, I don't know why that happened. It was really weird. Um, I do have the actual recording on my streaming computer, so eventually when I upload it to YouTube, you'll, you'll be able to see the full version. But yeah, I was editing it, and I saw that point. It basically just, just jumped. It went from me explaining something to like a bunch of code already on the screen.
I'm trying to find uh, what I what do I need to get ignore for this. Um, dot net new get ignore really. I think I figured it out though. Um, Cool. <laughs> Just remove the whole directory. Great. Uh, this is a pixelized version of Denver, Colorado behind me. Uh, okay, here, here it is. If you want to look at all my, my messy code, take a look at it there. Um, also, the readme has all of those links that I was showing you earlier, though, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, all right, we're going to go on a raid. Um, I don't know where we're going to go, but uh, wherever we go, be sure to uh, treat them nicely. Drop a follow if you like what they're doing, all that good stuff. Um, Got some raid messages. Thank you, Andrew. If you're a sub, this is your raid message. Um, if you're not a sub, you can use this one. You can also come up with your own raid message. Also, we have some animated emotes. Um, oh yeah, if any uh, any C sharp people in here, you can definitely use a C sharp uh, C sharp Fritz emotes. So we did a lot of C sharp today. Um, but yeah, we have some animated emotes, like the coding ah, and the coding clap, and there's also a coding bog roll like that. Feel free to use some of those. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, next plan, next stream is planned for next Friday. We'll probably keep working on this. I say probably, because sometimes I don't feel like doing the things I say I'm going to do. Um, but... Probably we'll finish what we started today, next week, uh, Friday, around the same time. All right, wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here is this. Thank you.